हेलो गुड आफ्टरनून मैम 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 हाय मैम हेलो हाय मैम यस ओके सो आई सी देयर आर अराउंड 41 स्टूडेंट्स हियर let's go on and start our session okay let me share my screen with you <clears throat> are you all able to hear me Yes. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. All right. So today we're going to start uh, the ninth unit. Okay. This is an EG three class conducted by uh, IGNU uh, Regional Center, Kochi, and uh, my name is Anita Menon. By now you must be knowing that I'm sure. And this is the last novel. Okay. Uh, ninth novel in the EG three section. It is British novel. Hmm? and this last novel is uh, written by Muriel Sparks okay the prime of miss jean broad that's uh, what the novel is okay the title of the novel and you can see the uh, uh, the writer's picture there on the screen so the other previous classes that we did you know we have seen uh, colonial africa uh, You know the colonial powers trying to uh, control Africa and what happens there in the name of colonialism, right? We have seen that. Then, uh, in a passage to India, we saw how India was uh, during the British Raj, and then we come to Muriel Spark. Okay, that is the author of this novel that we are going to study, The Prime of Miss Jean Brodie. Then we come to Muriel Spark. we are going to see how life was in the post world war 1 era especially life in the scottish uh, scottish uh, city of edinburgh and her work you can say you know kind of reflects the apocalyptic and crisis oriented views of history apocalyptic like you know the uh, final day the doom's day the end of the world so apocalyptic and crisis centered so after the world war the entire world was going through crisis so we see that sort of uh, world being depicted in this novel okay now if you look at the left of the screen see virginia wolf and dh lawrence names of these authors i'm sure you must have heard so virginia wolf and dh lawrence identified 1910 and 1915 respectively as the years when the human character changed and the old world order collapsed so whatever was uh, <coughs> relevant in the earlier period all that changed when the world was sorena sorena hello um, hello can you please tell a little louder it's difficult to hear okay. oh okay all right uh, i you let me let me make it louder okay all right so uh when the human this was a time you know virgin is it clearer i'm speaking louder i hope it's clearer so virginia wolf from dh lawrence they identified the period from 1910 and 1915 respectively as a years when the human character changed and the old world order collapsed completely changed the modernist writing was characterized by so what is modernism okay the writing that we call as modernist period it was characterized by breakdown of the pre industrial way of life and economy okay whatever was relevant in the pre industrial era all that changed uh, uh, those of you who have unmuted your microphones please mute it okay 
please mute it so that at least my voice carries over i don't want anyone having trouble uh, being able to hear my voice okay so please check your microphones if you, if it's unmuted please mute it okay now we're talking about uh, how there was a change during the modernist period okay it, everything from the pre industrial way of life and economy was changed and uh, it everything was influenced by urbanization and the destruction of reason there were a lot of uncertainties uh, based on the world wars that had happened now literature in this sense you know uh, whatever happens in the world definitely gets reflected in art and literature so literature in the sense conveyed the sense of bleakness and alienation a you know, sense of hopelessness that the people were feeling disintegration futility anarchy that had engulfed the human psyche so lawlessness anarchy you know at the chaos so all of that was reflected in the way writers approached their works now what we're going to talk about literature during this period okay literature reflected undertones of extreme self consciousness introversion and skepticism so people were very questioning and uh, cynical about whatever was happening so they were conscious of themselves and also kind of introverted looking into themselves and elements of the anti representational came to the fore as poetry reveled in verse libre of free verse up till then uh, rhyme and rhythm was given so much of importance right everything should rhyme meter was important but then with uh, verse libre of free verse everything that was anti representational came to the forefront Uh, in poetry it reflected itself in uh, free verse gaining momentum and in novels you know it started showing itself in the stream of consciousness narrative we already discussed what stream of consciousness is the end of world war 2 brought about what w h auden a prominent poet uh, in 1947 called age of anxiety the, that was called age of anxiety by Uh, w h auden after the end of the second world war the nightmarish realities of the battlefield had imprinted themselves on the psyche of man who had to come to terms with the destruction and desolation so that this was after the second world war imagine uh, human beings who went through that just like now we are going through the corona crisis people who outlived the second world war had seen destruction and massacre to such a big extent right they had gone through this time of the nuclear bomb widespread massacres new borders new and fallen regimes you know so fallen regimes and new borders being created a uh, time of holocaust and things like that so people had lived through the worst okay the sense of holocaust see what is holocaust what is holocaust when hitler persecuted millions and millions of jews jews okay? were executed a, yes so the sense of holocaust dominated the sensibility of the years that followed the post world war mar- marked in the way the end of modernism with the deaths of literary giants like james joyce virginia woolf and w b yeats james joyce we already know virginia woolf we we have heard about right so a room of one's own very well known for her work Room of One so, and Yeats also. Uh, so a new strain of liberalism was born that would embody the tragic sense of life. Now people did not want to, uh, you know, be uh, cooped in or be made to obey the old order. Nothing that was gone, right? A new sense of liberalism was born, which would embody this uh, tragic sense that had come to rise. A tragic. Uh, shade that had come to creep over lives literature saw the world in its human multiplicity and portrayed the contradiction and ambiguity that lay beyond the limits of ideology and certainty nothing was certain anymore and literature mirrored this sort of uh, you know doubt in the heart of people the ambiguity in the heart of the people that contradiction that was there everywhere the protagonist that is the central characters moved along in life imbued with a sense of alienation and beset by a sense of anguish so there was only unhappiness and a sense of being isolated separated from everything a sense of 
standing uh, away from whatever was going on around them. So the protagonist that you see in such novels was uh, one who was filled with, imbued with this sense of alienation and the sense of sorrow at the things that was happening. Novelists and their protagonists possessed a strange sense of purposelessness which prevented them from comprehending reasons for their existence. Meaning in existence had suddenly gone away. So you find that reflected in the central characters uh, portrayed by the novelists. Uh, one of the you know uh, important uh, things connected with the sense of purposelessness was the rise of the theater of the absurd. And when you say theater of the absurd, the name of Samuel Samuel Beckett comes connected with that. Okay, so Beckett's theater of the absurd. Uh, especially, uh, you know, represented in his uh, work called Waiting for Godo, written in 1953, uh, reinforced this feeling and revolutionized writing trends, completely changed writing trends. Now, what is this theater of the absurd? Okay. See, it's a movement made up of many diverse plays, mostly written between 40, 1940 and 1960. Essentially, what is it that each play renders man's existence as illogical and moreover meaningless. This is what is essentially the theater of the absurd. So e each uh, play shows, brings to the forefront that there is no meaning in life. There is no purpose in life. The idea was a reaction to the collapse of modern religious, political and social structures following the two world wars of the 20th century. In uh, Waiting for Godot, the play, uh, you find, you know, there are not many characters. There's one man who is waiting at a crossroads. He is waiting for Godo. Uh, he's just waiting. That's all that is there, you know, that, that happens in that uh, work. So uh, you find that, you know, as he's waiting, nothing is happening. No one is coming, but he's waiting. This sense of waiting, kind of it becomes metaphorical, right? You're waiting for something to happen. Nothing happens. So a sense of hopelessness pervades this whole atmosphere. And that is what this theater of absurd is all about. So that is a kind of literature that was coming up after the two world wars. The old avant-garde faded away in the 1940s and the new avant-garde, avant-garde means that which is very new, right at the forefront. And the new avant-garde, which is post-modernist, came into being. So that which was considered new uh, before the 40s went away. And something newer stepped into its place. And that which is post-modernist. Uh, the began before that, modernism. And after that, what we call as a post-modernist period came into being. Now, modernism in literature reveals a breaking away from established patterns, traditions, and conventions and tries to offer fresh perspectives on the human being's position and function in the universe by experimenting greatly with form and style, right? So modernism itself, you know, it, it, it's always, it was about like breaking away from the established conventions, breaking away uh, with established patterns and experimentation also, a lot of experimenting regarding form and style. Now, postmodernism, is an extension of the preceding trends and is rather amorphous without clear shape or form in nature. So postmodernism is an extension of this, you know, that this general uh, thing that we associate with modernism, this uh, sense of, you know, breaking away from traditions and established patterns, breaking away from that experimentation with form and style that is there. But then postmodernism is an extension of this, you know, at the same time, it is not something that can be easily defined. It's rather amorphous means without any clear form or shape. Such writing, what we can say basically is that such writing consistently or consciously rejects symbols of authority and adopts an eclectic approach. Okay, I think uh, Martina, Martina, can you yes, hear me, Martina? Yes, ma'am. Martina, would you please? Yeah, I, I could be very happy if you would mute your microphone. Yeah, so, sure, I don't know, sure. are you taking notes? 
Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I can hear. Yeah, I can hear your pen moving. You know what? Oh, that okay, ma'am. Sorry, I'm sorry. Driven. Yeah. So, uh, thank you. Ah, huh? please uh, okay, mute your microphone. Okay. So going back to this. Uh, so postmodernism. It contains techniques like you know uh, expressing random, unaccountable experiences that guide acts of creativity. They also included elements of, you know, imitation. Uh, the two words that you connect with that parody and pastiche. Okay, uh, so uh, pastiche is also something you know that imitates the work of a different period or another artist, or another writer in this sense. Uh, so parody and pastiche, all of these became you know. Uh, very much more used. The techniques became more used in the postmodernist uh, writing, and then uh, the element of chance also plays a significant role in postmodernist writing. Now, plot, action, narrative, and analysis of character are often seen to be extraneous, as a novel is taken to be a medium that portrays individual version and vision of things. So uh, we, when we studied novels earlier, we were talking about the plot and the character analysis and all of these things. But in the postmodernist writing, all of these things became extraneous because what was trying to be, uh, you know, portrayed was the individual version and individual vision of things. And the writers that we can talk about, see. Franz Kafka, Kafka's Metamorphosis, James Joyce, Marcel Proust, Remembrance of Things, Samuel Beckett, Waiting for Godot. All of these writers had shown post-war writers the way in this particular regard. So postmodernists beginning, you can say that these were the writers who showed the way. This gave rise to the allied cult of the anti-novel in which a sustained plot was absent which was characterized by detailed analysis of objects, many repetitions, variations of time sequence, erratic beginning and endings. So beginnings and endings were not something which was very predefined or very well defined. It was very erratic the way beginnings and endings happen. And there were repetitions, then time sequence. This was very important. They played around with time sequence. So you don't find any linear uh, progression of events. They played around with time sequence also. These were some of the characteristics we can say of postmodernist novels. Now, postmodernism can thus be said to be a new cultural atmosphere in which the writer is inevitably aware of this open choice between tradition and experimentalism rather than a continuation of modernism or a reaction against it. So if this was postmodernism is not a reaction against modernism. It's not like that. This is rather a continuation. At the same time, they are aware that they can take their own choices. They can build a new, uh, a new thread of uh, stories. So that is what essentially postmodernism is. Now we're going to talk about modes of narrations. Okay, different modes of narrations. So first one that we're talking about is narratives of nostalgia. So in this section, the first one is the narrative of nostalgia. Uh, fiction in Britain showed diversity and resilience in the 1950s. So a kind of atavistic. Atavistic means uh, opposing anything that is ancient or ancestral. You know, reversion. Kind of moving away from showing a reversion from anything that is ancient or ancestral. So a kind of atavistic no nostalgia. They did not, uh, this was not a nostalgia that thought lovingly about what had happened in the past, but rather an atavistic nostalgia impels some writers to look for man's origins and his lost innocence and displayed a yearning for good old days. These impulses were often mythologized and what emerged was a distinct distaste for civilization materialism, industrialism, and progress, and a conscious creation of the cult of the noble savage. So in this, uh, uh, in this nostalgic looking back, they did not, they rejected all this industrialization, all this materialistic tendencies that had crept into their lives, and they looked to something be before that, you know, and something uh, like a noble savage, uh, a noble savage, the concept of noble savage in literature means 
an idealized uh, man and uh, an idealized man who is untouched by civilization and uh, one who can express you know the goodness of uh, a person who has not been corrupted by the influences of the current civilization so that is the concept of noble savage so uh, in no narratives of nostalgia they explored this concept of noble na- savage also uh, examples we get here see william golding's lord of the flies the inheritors pincher martin along with saul bellows henderson the pain king uh, these are all examples they embody the timelessness of a myth representing pessimistic vision of the human predilection towards evil so uh, so they talk about you know this pessimistic vision of this human tendency to go towards evil which lies at the other end of innocence the opposite end of innocence where man shows this tendency to move towards evil conversely aldous huxley depicted a utopian way of life in his book called the island what is utopia utopia a place where ideal exactly yeah a place which is like you know ideal everything is perfect an ideal condition exists what is the opposite of that hypocrisy some kind of uh, no uh, the opposite of utopia is dystopia okay d y s t o p i a dystopia oh, okay yeah. yeah so this was also the time uh, of roman flop now what is this roman flop it's a novel featuring uh, the leisurely description of the lives of closely related people a sequence of related self contained novels it consisted of a series of novels each as each separate uh, novel in itself but it somehow interrelated because some characters might reappear in the other subsequent work also so this was uh, the this was also the time of roman flow so a series of novels uh, each one is a separate unit but there will be connecting things like probably a character appears uh, in more than one novel and uh, the writers that we associate with this are balzac zola uh, balzac uh, Uh, madam bovary uh, emil zola cp snow henry williamson anthony powell etc okay so now we go to another mode of narrative which is a political narrative political allegory was one of the modes that fiction turned to after the war uh, allegory where uh, you know you narrate a story like suppose there is a controversy and somebody wants to speak about the controversy but you know what they do they don't present it directly because that would be uh, sometimes a bit dangerous for the writer so they kind of present it uh, in a different story but there is a hidden meaning in that story which would actually be talking about another uh, issue another topic so that is a uh, an allegory uh, in earlier d- days you know uh, they use moralistic allegories where you know Uh, there were characters named uh, pilgrims progress and things like they, uh, characters were given names of qualities that human being should possess or should not possess like you know uh, evil and greed and uh, good man etc such uh, characters were given now here we have political allegory so stories that were written but uh, they were not stories or uh, just simply stories though although you could read them as such but where they actually were talking about hidden meanings deeper meanings especially connected with the political scenario of the time so political allegory was one of the modes uh, that fiction turned to after the war in this uh, uh, you know regard we cannot avoid speaking about george orwell's animal farm written in 1945 one of the first of these works of the post war era it's ostensibly uh, an animal fable when you look at it you know externally the story is that of an animal fable but between the lines it satirizes the totalitarianism that threatened to engulf the world so uh, we need the story there is another hidden story we find meaning in that and that is talking about totalitarianism uh, taking over power and ultimate control which was uh, which was the mood of the world at that time now when you look at it from the outer uh, level it's the story of a few animals you know animal farm 
the a farmer has a farm and there are all kinds of animals on the farm and they suddenly uh, rebel the animals gather together and rebel against the farmer they take him hostage and they get rid of him and they start ruling the farm at first when they start ruling they want to give equal uh, power and everything but soon that changes and uh, someone something like a dictator comes to the forefront so that sense of democracy and everything topples pretty fast so when you look at it it's the story of these animals the fable of these animals taking over the farm but when you look beneath that you know the book is actually an allegory of stalin's treachery with trotsky uh, the russian leaders okay trotsky uh, was uh, very much involved with this whole russian revolution many times he was um, uh, he, he was exiled from uh, russia and he was sent to siberia he was sent out out outside russia he uh, had to take uh, refuge in many countries but then when Le- lenin came to the forefront he came back and he was uh, you know sub- believed to be the successor of lenin but after lenin's death uh, stalin came to power and when stalin came to power again trotsky was exiled and he had to run away he found political refuge in uh, mexico uh, there were he had already survived many attempts on his life but in mexico finally Uh, even a machine gun attack trotsky had survived but uh, finally in mexico a man came one of the spanish revolutionaries came uh, and attacked him with a uh, with an axe i think and he was killed he was murdered in uh, uh, mexico so that is the story of trotsky and how stalin uh, you know how stalin overthrew him and exiled him and got him out of the picture so the book is an allegory of stalin's treachery with trotsky his betrayal of the revolutionary cause and his subsequent strategies for survival so animal farm is a, an allegory a political allegory another novel that comes to uh, mind is uh, orwell's 1984 okay written in 1949 so it reiterates the same idea against a framework of power equations the weapons of propaganda the scheme of terror and authoritarianism so that that novel is also on a similar way you know how it talks about this whole scheme of terror and authoritarianism it's an example of the anti utopian fable that contains the spirit of the perverted realism of the times so uh, what was realistic was no longer straightforward it was a very perverted realism that you see during that time and 1984 mirrors that then another uh, play that we have to talk about with regard to this is john osborne's play look back in anger written in 1956 uh, that uh, play actually gave rise to this term angry young man we have all heard of this term angry young man right so this is used to describe protagonists who were not angry in the strict sense of the term but they were pretty disgruntled they were dissatisfied they were irritated with themselves and their shabby environment now despite the writer vociferously disclaiming the label uh, the term had come to define those who chose to defy established norms and mores so anyone who was defying the established rules and regulations came to be referred to as an angry young man Uh, in our hindi cinema uh, do you know who was called angry amita bachchan amita bachchan yes, yeah <laughs> exactly so uh, this term became to uh, represent anyone who was uh, strong enough to stand up against the established norms and regulations but uh, osborne originally had just meant this to be a person who was very dissatisfied with themselves and with the environment in which they were okay the shabby environment in which they were then we uh, come to Uh, Kingsley Am is another writer his uh, book uh, Lucky Jim it's uh, perhaps the best illustration of this sort of novel and the protagonist Jim's anger is directed both against himself for being trapped as those who have trapped him in a world of hypocrisy and convention so you have he- examples you know of heroes who are dissatisfied with the world in which they are living in and they can't do anything and so they become angry and the anger turns inward 
then uh, so uh, political narratives these are the ones and now we have narratives of morality uh, the modern oh, you have to excuse me for the mistake in that uh, slide there it's written modern it's not modern it's modern m o d e r n the r and the n joined together okay excuse me for that uh, the modern condition is portrayed sensitively in the works of graham green uh, another writer graham green set against seedy landscapes his writing focuses on the spionage treachery moral and political confusion that pervades the real world so uh, graham green's novels are you know about topics like uh, spy work as spionage then treachery so and also the you know confusion that prevails whether it is in the field of morality or in the field of politics and green use usually focuses on some ambiguous moral issue as the heart of the matter the heart of the matter is also the name of his book uh, in his major novels and uh, he is also you know see nihilistic tendencies can be seen in his works now what is nihilism see something that uh, rejects all religious and moral principles and the belief that life is meaningless so a uh, abject sense of meaninglessness pervades the mind and the thoughts of the central characters in his uh, book so the, that kind of nihilistic tendencies so nihilism nihilistic undertones can also be identified in green's writing which often describes the strange effects of good causes and the self destructive tendencies in the compassionate so even the compassionate people have this uh, sense of self destruction the the self destructive tendencies all that is mirrored in his uh, works and his uh, important works are see the heart of the matter and the end of the fi two examples there now another mode of narrative is ironic documentary an outstanding exponent of ironic documentary another post war trend is the writer evelyn war uh, resorting to parody and farce you know uh, farce also is like you know uh, com comedy you know a comedy uh, where everything is blown up beyond proportions he is a satirist so uh, humor is often used to point out the defects and bring out right what is uh, what is uh, uh, lost or missing uh, in you know uh, an environment so that that satire is important for that so evelyn war is a satirist whose characters value themselves a bit too highly and are then made to face absurd situations uh, and war can be considered the chief creator of black humor in modern fiction on modern british fiction the dark humor you know so that is uh, evelyn war then in the audion of uh, gilbert pinfold which is written in 1957 is contained an account of an artist whose creative powers have deserted him and who undertakes a sea voyage to recover from his debility this is uh, something about that work you know uh, the artist who has lost his uh, creativity and who wants to refresh himself by taking a voyage recovery comes in the form of hallucinations Uh, has as he suffers to overcome the combined effects of personal ill health drugs and rough seas so in during the voyage rough seas and uh, ill health and the use of drugs all of these things you know and the hallucinations that he has all of these forms part of his recovery and these hallucinations comprise the novel which is also a self portrait of its creator now you can say the central character that is the war slash pinfold entity right a pinfold is a representation of the writer himself war uh, that sees escape in these visions the hallucinations are uh, uh, are avenues for him to escape and that is his, uh, that is how he uh, is able to uh, rebuild himself the technique heightens the sense of alienation and meaninglessness in the modern world so this is what you will find generally in the works of that period and now we come to another mode of uh, narration that is a comic realism now with this regard see anthony burgess uh, who was also a catholic like graham green is known for his comic realism and his interest in language and etymology origin of words you know etymology 
His chief thematic concerns were the sense of sin and the consciousness of disaster on social play. Uh, his two well-known works, one is The Clockwork Orange, which is very famous, and The Wanting Seed in 62. They are apocalyptic fables that satirize human absurdity. Uh, Clockwork Orange is set in a socialist society where, among other ills, language has declined. So language has completely declined in that society, socialist society. And Alex, the hooligan narrator, is de-emotionalized with the result that his devotion to music, the aesthetic recourse of this otherwise violent personality, is lost forever. And he comes to symbolize a typically conformist member of a socialist regime. So the socialist regime, you know, where language has collapsed and uh, the central character is no longer uh, able to, you know, show the devotion to music, which was the thing that, uh, you know, kept his uh, personality in order. And he becomes uh, completely, you know, changed. He becomes just another uh, typical conformist member of a socialist society, a socialist regime uh, rule. So that is uh, Clockwork Orange, right? And then uh, what about the women writers during this period? See, 1950s are marked by a proliferation of women writers whose work seem to rise from the changed realities following the catastrophic experiences of the war. Uh, they are also not an exception. They are also very much affected by the war and their writing also mirrors the experiences uh, of having gone through the catastrophic experiences of the war. Now, the post-war social, economic, cultural patterns radically altered the nature of reality for these women and bringing uh, new opportunities for them. The questions of identity, career, sexual and economic freedom became issues for conscious decisions. So uh, for a woman, you know, questions of career, questions of identity, questions of economic freedom, questions of sexuality, all these became topics that could be addressed rather than being subjects for hope and speculations. So in, they, they were not, they could take decisions based on their uh, identity, economic freedom, etc. not just speculate about it. Uh, women novelists like Doris Lessing, Iris Murdoch reflect these concerns in their works. Their sensibility transmuted with great finesse into their creations is reflected in the ability to conceive women characters who neither totally conform to nor are they in sustained conflict with their masculine counterparts. So uh, as uh, women writers, they are not uh, writers who are on a war path with their male counterparts. It's not like that. Okay, They appear as personalities with an identity of their own and symbolize a microcosm of historical and personal conflicts that affect society. Muriel Sparks' writing is also a testimony to this rich and diverse trend in the 20th century fiction. So that is about the women writers. Now, uh, talk, uh, going on to the next slide, we are talking, going to talk a little bit more about these women writers. Doris Lessing. Lessing's fiction usually takes up the concerns of identity and art in an environment where systems collapse and require an evolution of consciousness. Lessing's characters uh, seem to be in danger of drowning in the collective political and psychological consciousness, but right. are able to claw their way back from disintegration through a reintegration of consciousness. Okay, That is about Lessing's work. Then going to Iris Murdoch's works. See, displaying her talent for humor, uh, his her works, uh, Iris Murdoch's works are marked by a sense of alienation, degeneration, and protest. But you see, I've been mentioning this word, you know, alienation and degeneration and protest. And so this was the riding uh, feeling, you know, the overriding feeling that encompassed many writers, whether they are men or women. Now, uh, Iris Murdoch's work, see, written in 1957, The Sandcastle. It's like set against the background of an English school. The headmaster has a brief extramarital affair with an artist commissioned to do a painting for the school. 
ultimately fear triumphs as a sense of duty obligation and socially dictated pragmatism come in the way of any long term commitment so murdoch's characters are either stand steadfast in their commitment and become morbidly grim okay they, they become very very grim morbid terribly grim or they change you know they they kind of move between vacillate between experiences due to the absence of any fixed pattern in their lives now coming to uh, muriel sparks novels you know they are clever and entertaining as they reflect humor and irony what is irony it's like a double edged sword you say something but there is another meaning a deeper meaning that. yeah yeah so not only does her writing arouse the reader's sensibility and emotion but it also stimulates the intellect by piecing experience into patterns which characters identify with or seek to assimilate hmm? uh, the conflict between good and evil overshadows events as a fictive character struggle to comprehend truth and values uh, Mir- muriel sparks characters now uh, another uh, mode of narration is a detective fiction okay another mode of fiction see that deserves mention as a detective story it involves crime usually an insoluble murder then there will be a variety of su- suspects a seasoned detective who finds solution with impeccable logic and reasoning a number of writers are known for this sophisticated form of fiction uh see the writers that you can associate with this agatha christie you definitely must have heard the others are dorothy l sayers vagari allen gam and p d james uh so the uh, i mean the, so these all this introductory material is given in your study material and uh, you must read this okay you must be aware because you could very well get a question as to the you know modes of uh, narration different modes of narration during this particular period in the history of the novel so uh, make sure you do make notes of your own regarding this uh, i think this forms the first chapter in your book uh, modernism and after so i'm actually talking to you from that part so we come to that you know last section in that chapter the first chapter that is a vision literature or science fiction the vision literature of the middle ages which explored the metaphysical world of heaven and hell and purgatory purgatory is a in between place you know heaven and hell and in between is the purgatory so its manifestation in the post war era in the form of science fiction so the, the vision literature that you know talked about heaven and hell and purgatory in the middle ages that showed itself in the post war era as a form of science fiction and it it wanted to you know explore the unknown go like you hear in the star trek thing you know go beyond that most uh what is it bounds of humanity Go where no like man that. has gone before yeah exactly <laughs> so something like that you know so exploring the unknown right the trend set very much earlier by mary shelley in frankenstein you know that the trend for the science fiction was set by mary shelley when she wrote the frankenstein in 1818 uh you know how she came about to write frankenstein right so all of these uh, shelley and mary shelley and uh, byron all of them their friends and they used to gather in the evening and uh, talk about you know their writing and stuff and once uh, they all decided to uh, write something uh, you know fantastical uh, and uh, she, mary shelley also wrote and she came up with this frankenstein where uh because of like experiments a scientist conducting experiment uh, creates a monster uh maybe we can say this is like you know the early uh, early form of like you know uh, grafting of skin and you know the genetics and all of that coming into play and uh, what happens in the uh, story is how this uh, creature almost like a you know not human a dead but man born to life yeah so uh, almost like you know hum- i mean in appearance looks like a monster but it has human tendencies but because of its appearance as a monster nobody is uh, willing to give it you know or get close to it until finally you know the the good heart or whatever 
positive feelings it had you know it evaporates and the very uh, maker the very creative uh, he frankenstein wants to uh, you know kill the very uh, the very maker the one who made him so it also has several metaphorical layers attached to it uh, and um, mary shelley was the one who wrote this you know i mean uh, something very you know new for its age from th- something which was way way beyond the age in which it was written and uh, when she wrote it you know she could not publish it in her name uh, as a woman you know so she, it, 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 she had to like afterwards only like after many years only was it published in her name anyway that's beside the point so what i'm coming to is uh, science fiction and uh, the trend was set with uh, mary shelley uh, writing frankenstein and it continued after the war and the specter of the nuclear bomb haunted the minds of many h g wells the shape of things to come written in 1933 typified this kind of writing another science fiction writer is isaac asimov wrote a wide variety of such fiction and uh, a novel that is uh, notable as i robo written in 1957 then windham in the 50s published a series of novels that amalgamated joined you know old fashioned romance with modern science fiction by depicting ordinary people caught up in desperate struggle for survival uh, his outstanding contributions are the kraken wakes and midwich cuckoos then another writer science fiction writer is arthur c clarke and asimov and arthur c clarke are very well known science fiction writers so also is h g wells is another major writer of the time and is especially known for childhood's end and the city of the stars so uh, these are the uh, modes of narration that you will find during this era okay now modern fiction oscillates between voices that endeavor to explore a new aesthetic avenues of expression and others that seek to critically represent the contemporary life so you have you know people who are trying to ex- explore new ways of expression and also people who are trying to critically uh, represent what was happening in the particular uh, time period david lodge the critic in his book the novelist at crossroads sums it up remarkably well by asserting that the novelist has arrived at a metaphoric crossword in his of her legacy uh, as a mixture of many trends and traditions so a novelist uh, is and become actually a mixture of several trends and traditions now this sums up the literary scenario after the two world wars and we have looked at the subsequent emergence of trends of modernism and postmodernism and i've seen the immense variety and vitality that contemporary fiction displayed now going to muriel spark okay her life uh, her works and Uh, yeah, her her life, her works, and about this text. Okay, yeah. Uh, so she was born in nineteen eighteen in Edinburgh, in Scotland, to Bernard Camberg, a Jewish engineer. Her mother, Sarah Elizabeth Maud, was of Italian descent. Muriel Spark was educated at the James Gillespie School for Girls, which she has fictionalized in her novel *The Crime of Miss Jean Broad*. She left school in 1935 and got a teaching job. Here, she preferred to get free tuition in uh, shorthand and typing rather than a salary, and this helped her to type the manuscripts for her own works. In 1937, she got engaged to Sidney Oswell Spark. who sailed to the southern rhodesia which is now zimbabwe and joined him there a few months uh, after a few months they got married the marital life was a turbulent one as a husband uh, 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 her husband began to show signs of mental instability and had fits of violence so she had to undergo domestic violence two years later The Second World War broke out, and uh, S.O. Spark, Sidney Oswell Spark, had to join the army. Muriel decided to press for divorce, which came through in 1942. She sailed back to England in 1944, despite the dangers of being torpedoed by German submarines on the way. Uh, once in London, she worked in the Political Intelligence Department of the Foreign Office, 
this involved her she even left her son and came you know uh, she, uh, she worked in the political intelligence department of the foreign office and this involved her active participation in psychological warfare that endeavored to camouflage the anti nazi propaganda a year after the war spark found a job in a good quarterly magazine called arjunala and here she got a grounding in editing and proofreading and copy editing and this experience you know helped her when in the spring of 1947 she took over as a editor of the poetry review she was only 29 uh, years old and had joined the poetry society as a member just a year before now her enthusiastic advocacy of modernism antagonized members who called for her dismissal so uh, anybody who calls for new trends right i mean it's not easy for them to get their way in so she was also looked at with disapproval by the members of the poetry uh, review and uh, poetry society and she was a new member and a young member at that and so uh, you know she left the society after that and in 1948 she founded a poetry magazine of her own which was called the forum and she continued to write poetry and finally published her collection the fan farlo and other was in 1952 then uh, yeah um, an important event in her life you know is a conversion to roman catholicism she later claimed that she began writing her novels only after she became a roman catholic and saw life in its totality rather than as a series of disconnected occurrences so for her what gave her stability she felt this is conversion into Roman Catholicism, and she began writing her first novel, *The Comforters*, which was published in 1957. With this publication came financial security, and Muriel Spark moved to Rome in 1966. This city became her home and forms the backdrop of many of her novels. So many of her novels are set in Rome, because she uh, was living there. I mean, once her writing became successful. Park was a recipient of numerous literary accolades and uh, awards during her lifetime. Her first award in the literature field was the Observer Short Story Prize, 1951, for Seraph and Zambezi. She followed that up with the Prix Italia uh, for the radio play adaptation of the Ballad of Peckham Rye. Four years later, her novel, The Mandelbaum Gate, earned her the Yorkshire Post. uh yorkshire post book of the year award in 1965 and the jane state black memorial prize then several uh, decades later not later later in 1987 spark received the scottish book of the year award for the stories of muriel spark first prize uh, fnac la mia uh, recall the novel etrangers uh, i don't know my french pronunciation might not be on dot Uh, or for the in eighty seven for the edition spared translation of the stories you can see like you know just look at it okay look at that one you know she's got such a lot of awards and finally see the list of honorary degrees that she got uh, she got honorary degrees from University of Strathclyde University of Edinburgh then University of Aberdeen Wyatt University uh, Watt University. Uh, University of Saint Andrews uh, and Oxford University in as late as 1999. So extremely prolific and extremely well accomplished, right? She went on to become. Then going on to her works. So the works of Muriel Spark. Uh, Muriel Spark in her autobiography, Curriculum Vitae. she states that all experience is good for an artist and the essentials of literature lie out in the world this claim is corroborated you know is uh, substantiated in her work uh, in her works which are born out of uh, some of her most memorable experiences so what happens in her life gets reflected in the works that she writes her involvement in the intelligence departments of the foreign office is reflected in the psychological warfare indulged in by her characters as they seek to carve out their respective places within their environment so whatever experience she got in from working in the intelligence department of the foreign office is reflected you know in her characters and 
you know the area of psychological uh, depth that she gives to her characters sparsi's life is chaotic state and strongly believes that it is for the novelist to perceive and evolve an order out of it a prolific writer she began her uh, literary career as a poet at the age of 9 during her sojourn uh, travels in africa she took to writing short stories but finally adopted the novel as a preferred medium for creative writing so from the age of 9 she has been she uh, had been writing and uh, uh, she was writing poetry very early now poetry when she went to rhodesia at the age of 19 just after marriage spark wrote some poetry and many uh, short stories the poems were then published in 1952 in a collection called the fanfarlo and other works and in 1967 appeared collected poems one and in 1982 she uh, published another collection called short pieces and poems drawn from experiences in her personal life spark's poetry is very subjective and lyrical now uh, about her short stories africa serves as an inspiration and background of many of spark's short stories and novels because she lived there for some time she writes about the homesickness felt by the whites in the alien continent the story bang bang you're dead is based on a real life incident that involved spark's friend neeta mckevin who was shot dead by her husband uh, so that is part one of the stories in another story the curtain blown by the breeze The writer describes the violent horrors of apartheid as she experienced it among the Rhodesian whites. Short st- uh, Sparks' short stories tend to fictionalize incidents from her own life. Now, going to her novels. Her first novel, *The Comforters*, written in 1957, was written shortly after conversion to Roman Catholicism. It combines the author's religious convictions and literary values while exploring the relationship between the author and the character. Frank Kermode, the critic, refers to the Comforters as a novel about writing a novel. The title describes the persecuting effect of voices heard by the main character. Uh, writes Park in her autobiography, *Curriculum Vitae*. The second novel, *Robinson*, written in 1958, takes up the story of plane crash survivors. who were marooned on an island stuck on an island and memento mori another novel in 1959 explores the metaphysical mystery of death the story revolves around a group of elderly people who receive anonymous telephone calls ostensibly from death itself and are always made aware of their imminent mortality uh, the ballad of peckham rye written in 1960 spark delves into the supernatural once again It revolves around the demonic figure of uh, Dougal Douglas, who, uh, as a personal assistant, is given the task of looking into the inner lives of workers and helping them to enhance their professional performance. Another uh, another novel that she wrote in 1960 called *The Bachelors*, uh, where the characters are caught up in a web of demonology, demon, demonology, uh, spiritualism, and spurious beliefs. Then in sixty comes another novel, which is the Prime of Miss Jean Brodie. It's a novel about a school teacher whose fascistic tendencies come to the fore and result in her enforced enforced retirement. Now the book served as a basis for a very high, uh, like you know, a, a very popular, highly successful film, uh, The Girls of Slender Meals. Another novel came in nineteen sixty three. Sparks draws inspiration from her own life. Set in the post-war years, the novel harks back to 1947, when the author had to take up residence in a London hostel called the Helena Club. Uh, through Barbara Wong, the Mandelbaum Gate in the Mandelbaum Gate in 1965, uh, Spark describes Jerusalem, a city divided by the Mandelbaum Gate along religious and ethnic lines. Now, the Israeli side and the Jordanian side was divided by this Mandelbaum Gate. And, how it fractured the whole society you know people had to go through endless lines of checking and showing their identities in order to probably go to work or just visit their relatives across the gate so it was not an easy way of life so sparks describes that in her novel mandelbaum gate talking about the mandelbaum gate which divided the uh, place accord, uh, according to religious and uh, ethnic lines and it evokes a sense of divisiveness that characterizes the jewish christian and arab population in this ancient city a note about the mandelbaum gate 
uh, is a former checkpoint between the Israeli and the Jordanian sectors in Jerusalem, uh, north of the western edge of the old city and along the Green Line. So that was where Mandelbaum Gate was situated. And she wrote a novel about what it meant to be living in this divided city. In 1970, she wrote another novel in the driver's seat. Uh, the Lizzie, the victim, provides a twist in the tale by seeking out her own killer, takes over from the novelist as an alternative plot maker. Through her, Spark poses the central question about who is in the driver's seat, the novelist or the character. Right? When, a, when someone writes, you know, uh, you, have, you might have heard how writers say, you know, I, I mean, it was not me who wrote, the character seemed to write itself out. So, so something like that happens in this novel, you know, you see the victim takes over, kind of, you know, takes over from the narrator and sets out in search of her own killer. Not to disturb another novel in 71 is a thriller set in a stately home. The Hot House by the East River in 73, it's set in New York in 1973. And, it, and in it, the central conflict is between moral and metaphorical truth. It invokes, uh, it invokes sorry, psychological warfare that Spark describes so well after her stint in the intelligence department of the Foreign Office. Then a takeover in 1976, and the plot uh, is about the intrigues and fraud that surface in the world of art. It is set in Italy. Territorial rights is about blackmail and corruption uh, present in the big business interest and it's in the backdrop of Venice. Uh, loitering with intent uh, is about, uh, you know, going back to this autobiographical heroine, Fleur Talbot, a novelist. So an, a character who seems to be an autobiographical heroine. Uh, the writer analyzes the balance between fact and fiction, and the novel becomes a self-conscious celebration of a woman as an artist in the 20th century. Now, uh, 84, the only problem, uh, Job and his fortunes are the central focus uh, based on the book of Job in the Old Testament, right? The character of Job who was given seven years of uh, good period and seven years of intense hardship as a form of test. The novel contains an account of Harvey, Harvey Gotham, who retires to France to write a monograph on the biblical character of Job. Well, another uh, novel, A Far Cry from Kensington, is based on Spark's experience at a part-time job at Falcon Press London. Insanity and religious mania are the predominant themes in another novel that she wrote in 1990 called The Symposium. In 1996 uh, comes another book called Reality and Dreams, which is set in London, and it revolves around the life of a filmmaker, Tom Richards. It's a story of a search for the right character by the filmmaker, for whom all projects start as dream prior to being presented before the audience as reality. Because what is Sparks Fiction generally about? See, it's about mysterious nature of life in which truth lies beyond reason and is recognized through acts of faith. Contrariness of human nature is brought to the forefront through paradox of situation and character. So uh, she has also, in addition to all these novels, she has also written plays. See, she has written a number of radio plays. These include The Interview, Dry Riverbed, The Ballad of Peckham Rye, and Dangerous Zone. Then, in early 50s, Muriel Spark worked on a few authors that particularly appealed to her literary sensibilities. With Derek Stanford, she edited a tribute to Wordsworth on the centenary of the poet's death. She's also written a critical biography of Mary Shelley called Child of Light, and she has edited a selection of letters of the Bronte sisters. Besides this, she's also worked on the poet John Masfield. So she has written poetry, she has written novels, short story, plays, biography, and literary criticism. There's no area that she has not touched upon. Now we come to the text of the novel, and we'll talk about some of the uh, details regarding the text. Okay, So the text, a summary of the crime of Miss Jean Brody. Chapter 1. The novel set in Edinburgh in Scotland revolves around Miss Jean Brodie, a teacher in the Marcia Blaine School for 
girls. It's autumn of 1930. The book was published in 1961, but it's showcasing a time period in the 1930s. It's in the autumn of 1930 that the book opens, and the school stayed atmosphere, a very stable, stayed atmosphere, characterized by tradition and conformity, is totally shaken by uh, Miss Brodie's presence. She views herself as a kind of progressive rebel who adopts extremely unconventional modes of educating impressionable young girls put in her charge. Uh, her motto is that: see, safety does not come first. goodness truth and beauty do this is this is a motto with which she works and uh, yeah she feels that you know she is different from other teachers as lessons proceed miss brodie's dominant personality succeeds in making her pupils participate and share in the guilty secret of only pretending to do school work but actually listening to tales of her unfulfilled romance with you character so uh, she doesn't make her children actually make, make her students actually do uh, school work rather she uh, takes up their time by telling them about her uh, failed romance with this man called Hugh Carothers the highly romanticized tale of a relationship ended makes her pupils regard her in the light of a tragic heroine who despite great personal odds is struggling to transform them into the creme de la creme of society by Im- imbuing them with a sense of distinction and making them feel a cut above the rest miss brody manages to win the affection and loyalty of six girls so uh, spinning all these tales of you know unfulfilled love and all that she uh, gets closer to the girls who regard her as a tragic heroine who's wasting the prime of her life to take care of them to develop them into the creme de la creme of society so and and she especially manages to get close to six girls you know who form like a group uh, devoted to her completely loyal to her and these six girls see they are monica douglas who was in later life well known for her mathematical prowess and her quick anger then rose stanley who becomes famous for sex eunice gardiner who was a sprightly gymnast sandy stranger who with her exceptionally small eyes came to be known for the clarity of her vowel sounds the graceful jenny gray who became known for her histrionic capabilities histrionic what does that mean histrionic eccentric no ability to act acting histrionic is acting okay Uh, Mary McGregor, whose fame rested on her being a silent lump, an insipid personality without any of the distinction that marked the others. So these were the girls uh, who were in her power, who were totally loyal to her. Monica Douglas, then Rose Sta- Rose Stanley, Eunice Gardiner, Stan Sandy Stranger, uh, then uh, Jane uh, Jenny Gray, and Mary McGregor. These were the girls. Okay. Miss Brody took to grooming them according to her insights. They were often invited for meals by her, and then indoctrinated with principles that Miss Brody held dear to her heart. So the teacher was sort of manipulating them. Only with them she discussed the differences she had with her colleagues and unsuccessful attempts that she had been that had been made to remove her from the school staff. So. and she called them over for food she talked to them became friends with them and often she discussed uh, whatever was happening at her work with these girls and she often told them that because she was so unconventional nobody liked her and the teachers were other teachers were all conspiring to get rid of her from the school now the girls sense of indebtedness intensified with this police constant reminders of how all else in her life was secondary as she dedicated her prime to them prime the best part of her life right prime so she she told them you know time and again how she had dedicated her prime to them they tried to protect her from the machinations of the headmistress miss mackey and the other mistresses so the girls took it upon themselves to protect her the brody set you know these six girls together they were called as a brody set was thus born and each member's sword eternal allegiance to miss brody 
Now, though not very well informed about the subjects that formed their curriculum, the Brody set had more knowledge than their peers about Mussolini, Renaissance painters, skin cleansing cream, Menard, Einstein, the love life of Charlotte Bronte, and the rudiments of astrology. So the topics that uh, the teacher taught them was not anything connected with their curriculum. But then these girls got a lot of information about, you know, uh, Mussolini from Italy, right? The, uh, the leader who was with Hitler, right? Mussolini, uh, then Renaissance painters, uh, then... Uh, uh, skin cleansing creams, Menarche, Menarche means uh, menstruation, uh, Einstein, the love life of Charlotte Bronte, the rudiments of astrology, all of these things were what uh, the teacher talked about. By 16 years, uh, they were as non-conformist as Miss Brody herself. So from the age of 10 to the age of 16, Miss Brody was talking to them. And by the age of 16, they became as unconventional as the teacher herself. Now, chapter 2. Much later in life, when Mary McGregor was deserted by her boyfriend, a corporal who did not turn up at a day, she remembers uh, remembered her school days as the happiest period of her life and relapsed into her usual bewildered state. She died rather horrifically at the age of 24 in a fire at Cumberland Hotel, where her usual dullness led her to repeatedly run through smoke-choked corridors and bring on asphyxiation. Asphyxiation means inability to breathe and die of breathlessness. Sandy and Jenny also shared with her the sense of ecstatic happiness. Sex predominated the imagination of these two girls who started writing their clandestine literary venture called The Mountain Ivy. It was an imaginative saga of the great romance that Miss Brody had with Hugh Carrother, the si soldier who died ironically just a few days before the armistice. So these two girls, you know, they were preoccupied with questions of sex and intimacy. And they imagined, you know, what would have been the love life of Miss Jean Brody. And they even wrote a fictitious work based on their imagination, which they called as a mountain ivory. And in this, they imagined uh, Hugh Carithers uh, as being a successful soldier. But uh, the two were uh, not successful in their relationship because Hugh Carrickers dies just before armistice, just before uh, the war was resolved. And they declare that any of their relationships in future would be free from sexual familiarity, but at the same time express a desire to closely see and inspect the nude figure of a Greek god in the local museum. So they are very curious. They want to go to a local museum and see what a nude, uh, the, the image of a nude man, how does he look like? They plan uh, the trip with Miss Brody, knowing that nudity could never bother her like other grown-ups. So she was different from other grown-ups and she would not be phased by, you know, the, the prospect of uh, viewing nudity up close. There is an account of Miss Brody's poetry class in which she recites Tennyson's poem, The Lady of Shallot. Through it, she wants her pupils to cultivate the art of composure practiced by the lady. So she was fond of this uh, character in The Lady of Charlotte. And she uh, teaches her girls uh, this poem. And she wants them to be as composed and poised as the central character in that, uh, in that uh, poem. Which she feels is one of the best assets of a woman. To be composed or to be poised, she feels is the best asset for her woman. Jenny with her golden ringlets and sweet voice enraptured Mr. Lauter, the music teacher, who daringly twitched her curls and encouraged her to sing. So in the second chapter you find Jenny, look, she looks beautiful and she has golden curls and the music master, Mr. Lauter, uh, touched her curls and encouraged her to sing. By 1931, Miss Brody had selected her favorites and knew she could rely on them in moments of crisis when matters reached a head between her and the headmistress. So when, whenever the, there was a fight between her and the headmistress, you know, she knew that the Brody set would come to her help. More than the girls themselves, she was very uh, sure that she could trust the parents to come to her aid. So she could tr trust them not to, the parents of these girls, she could trust them not to lodge complaints about the more advanced and seditious aspects of her educational policy. 
the divisive aspects, seditious aspects, the divisive or controversial aspects of her educational policy. And then she also took the girls for walks, long walks in the, around Edinburgh, especially in the older parts of the city. And it is through Sandy's memory and vision of one such occasion that one gets to understand that Miss Brodie understood them as a body with herself for the head in unified compliance to her destiny, as if God had willed them to birth for that purpose. So it, we, as readers, we get to hear about, you know, uh, how this can be approached, the, like the way she used to take the girls to the city, to even the old parts of the city and take them to walks around that, uh, around the various suburbs of various parts of the city. And Sandy remembers it and tells uh, us, you know, she reminisces, she, she remembers it and uh, writes about it like this, so, uh, that Miss Brody understood them as a body with herself for the head. So the thinking she does, the girls are just, uh, you know, like uh, something attached to the head, okay, in unified compliance to her destiny. So some uh, girls are as a whole supposed to be totally in compliance and agreement with whatever the teacher says, whatever Miss Brody says, because she pictured herself as the head and the girls as the rest of the body. As if, you know, it was as if the gods had willed the girls to be born just for the purpose of listening to Miss Brody. Uh, this is a quotation from page 36 of the book. On passing a group of girl guides when they went on their walk, once they happened to meet a group of girl guides and Miss Brody scorns them, doesn't like, approve of them, you know. She considers them a rival group whose sense of loyalty and duty might weaken and cause some of her group to forsake her. So they are a threat to her, you know, the girl uh, guides. They, they are organized, they are a group and they have this sense of unity within them. So Miss Brody doesn't like them, you know. She thinks that they are like a rival group and would threaten her uh, power amongst her uh, girls, you know, the, the six girls. So she was scared that if the girls joined the girls' guide, they would give her up. So she doesn't approve of the girl guides. The walk exposes the broadly set to dismal realities of the poorest suburbs of Edinburgh. They see unshod children, not wearing shoes, unshod children playing in the icy winds that sweep the city. Witness a man battering his wife, beating up his wife. Encounter another ravaged by alcohol and unemployment. And all too early in their lives, they come to know of harsh realities that their protective home environments tried hard to veil. So these girls were exposed to the harsh realities of life, unlike the others in the school. Even, uh, you know, in their home environment, they would never see such a thing. So Miss Brody took them for walks in the uh, you know, uh, in the poorer sections of the uh, of the of the city, and they got to see fights that were uh, really something that you know shook their uh, awareness of what was real life. In the course of the conversation during the walk, Miss Prodi lets out that she used to have an encounter with Miss Mackay, that is a headmistress, who questions her methods of instruction. She then proceeds to justify her method by defining education as coming from uh, the root E from X. You know, education, the word education, E comes from X, which means out. And duco means I lead. So altogether, it means a leading out. And she says, to me, education is a leading out of what is already there in the people's soul. So 28 years later, Miss Bro after Miss Brody's own death, Jenny, a nurse, tells her husband, a doctor, about the extraordinary hold that Miss Brody exercised on her set and expresses a desire to lay flowers at her grave when they next visit Edinburgh. Jenny also speaks of Miss Brody's betrayal to school authorities by one of the Brody set. So one of them betrays her to the school and succeeds in getting her expelled from the school or, or uh, I mean, uh, fired from the school. Sandy Stranger, who took orders as a nun later in life, remembers how their walks opened the windows of her mind to other people's Edinburgh, quite different from hers. So another girl, Sandy Stranger, she remembers, you know, how these walks 
and that showed the difficulties the lives of others who were living in edinburgh opening to her another edinburgh different from the one in which she lived opened her eyes to the realities of a people different from hers and i'm being asked about the biggest influence in her life remembers it as a miss jean brody in her prime so that's how we get the title see later as uh, sister helena of the transfiguration she had authored an odd psychological treatise on the nature of moral perception called the transfiguration of the common place so later on uh, sandy stranger takes up orders as a nun and becomes sister helena of transfiguration and she even writes a uh, moral treatise called transfiguration of the common place and even she remembers how the influence of this teacher when they were young a third chapter miss brody was not alone in her views or attitudes to life there were legions of her kind during the 1930s women from the age of 30 and upward who crowded their war bereaved spinsterhood with voyages of discovery into new ideas and energetic practices in art or social welfare education or religion they were great talkers and feminists who talked to men as man to man so the kind of person that you see in the character of miss brody it was not an unusual figure those days you know especially uh, in the post war era during the 1930s there were so many women like her uh, 30 years or more than 30 years old who were war bereaved like you know they were spinsters made uh, made spinsters because of the war men had died and they did not have any proper man to be attached to and uh, these people these women you know generally uh, went into uh, you know discovering new ideas and went into new practices whether it is in the field of art or social welfare or education or religion so such figures uh, the, the kind of figure represented by miss jean brody was a common thing in those days now once when miss brody in her history class uh, flitted from one digression to another miss mckay made an unexpected entry to remind the girls of the qualifying examination that had to be passed before entering senior school it caused miss brody some anxious moments but as soon as i had mr slip left she continued as if there had been no interruption uh, qualifying examination or no qualifying examination you will have the benefit of my experience in italy that's what she said okay so she could talk to them about her travels and everything uh, once when she was uh, just uh, digressing like this the headmistress came in and the headmistress is irritated by what's happening in the class and she reminds the girls that you do have an have an exam to pass right you have an you have a qualifying exam to pass and that that was like telling the teacher to get back to the topic right but uh, as soon as uh, the headmistress left you know miss brody continues uh, in her path of digression talking to the girls about her experiences in italy she then proceeded to tell them about her admiration for masolini who had performed feats of magnitude by abolishing unemployment she talked about colosseum in rome where gladiators fought and slaves were thrown to lions of the nasal way in which americans spoke her brief encounter with an italian poet and her admiration for this poet called rossetti all of these were the topics that she discussed with them you know talking about the colosseum in rome uh, the, the place where all these gladiators fought and the slaves uh, were thrown to the lions so uh, uh, these were the topics the, the nasal tone in which americans spoke then italian poets and rossetti admiration for the poet rossetti etc these were the topics that she talked to the girls about miss brody's working environment was marked by a hostility and resentment that her colleagues felt towards her none of the other teachers liked her there were however two exceptions to the general tide of feeling that flowed against her and these were the two men okay there were two men that is gordon lowther and the, the singing master and teddy lloyd the art master so two men uh, teachers who were in the school were in love with her both of them were in love with her one was lloyd the art master and the other was lowther the singing master the music teacher both were a little in love with miss brody and were beginning to compete with each other for her affections other than that all the other teachers did not like her 
she was unaware of this angle and saw them as her supporters to whom she felt infinitely grateful the brody set looked with greater interest upon mr lloyd who was better shaped and more sophisticated than mr louter so uh, the girls were aware of this you know that these two men teachers were very much uh, interested in uh, miss jean brody and the girls seemed to prefer the art teacher mr lloyd because he was Uh, you know had a better figure and looked uh, more sophisticated than the music teacher mr lauter but what added to the charm of mr lloyd was a golden lock of hair that fell o- over his brow and the fact that he had only one arm the other having been lost in the great war that was something which you know caught the imagination of these girls mr lloyd's practical analysis and appreciation of botticelli's masterpiece primavera that is the picture that you see uh, on the slide there primavera means spring okay botticelli uh, italian masters um, painting of spring and when he was talking to the girls about that you know he kept on uh, his pointer kept on tracing the nude outlines of the women in the painting and the girls started giggling there was a collective sound of mirth around the classroom and this made miss brody very angry mary out of all the girls was found giggling like a dirty minded child of an uncultured home it's a quotation from the book so she was mary was giggling like anything and miss brody uh, scolds her and sends her out of the room so her retribution was swift mary was propelled out of the room and this violent action restored the brighty among the rest of the class then came the news that one day after school mr lloyd had kissed miss brody in the art room monica douglas reported it to the brody set as an eyewitness account and initially there was a reaction of disbelief among the girls it was sandy who closely questioned monica about the details before accepting the veracity of the story the truth of the story This incident, which occupied the Brody set's imagination for many months to come, was kept a secret and shared only among her favored students. It began to be noticed that a subtle change had come over Miss Brody, who took to wearing new clothes and jewelry. So the story was that one day uh, somebody saw Mr. Lloyd kissing Miss Jane Brody, and uh, there was a subtle change in uh, a very fine change in Miss Brody that was noticed by the students, by the girls. they noticed that she was wearing better clothes and started wearing jewelry also then miss brody was away from school for two weeks with an ailment and her leave coincided with mr lauter's uh, leave of absence for ostensibly the same reason so both of them took leave and disappeared at the same time this set tongues wagging and miss gaunt miss gaunt was the one who came as her substitute when she took leave the substitute teacher was miss gaunt so temporarily replacing miss brody in the class miss gaunt she slyly suggested a connection between the two in a very cunning way miss gaunt seemed to suggest that you know mr lauter the music master and uh, miss brody who took leave at the same time uh, were having uh, some sort of relationship okay <clears throat> Okay, going on. Uh, see the next slide. Yeah. When Miss Brody returned after her vacation, she played for and occasionally sang along with Mr. Lauter during uh, practice for the annual concert. And Sandy could not help deducing that a strange love triangle involving Miss Brody, Mr. Lloyd, and Mr. Lauter had come into existence. the irony of the situation was that the singing master loved miss brody who in turn loved the drawing master jerry walking alone was one day accosted by a man in an isolated spot he first caught her attention and then proceeded to expose his genitalia to the innocent girl he flashed himself uh, after the initial shock jenny escaped unpursued and unscathed and the matter was reported to the police this was a secret which only jenny and sandy shared even miss brody was not allowed to get a whiff of it now in this chapter chapter 3 the focus is on sexual interpretation of the simplest of things the shuttle of sewing machines going up and down 
Sandy and Jenny completing a fictitious and highly romantic love correspondence between Miss Brody and Mr. Lowther, which ended in sexual intimacy. But as Miss Brody was dedicated to her girls in her prime, she declined marriage. She, however, admitted that her true affection was for Teddy Lloyd, who was married to another. So uh, uh, the the reality was that uh, Miss Brody actually loved the art master. Teddy Lloyd, but he was already married, and so uh, she wanted to throw people off her tracks, and that's how she attached herself to Mr. Lowther. Uh, later, when and uh, in this chapter, third chapter, you find the girls really preoccupied with, you know, sexual interpretations of everything that they see. later when miss brody had been forcefully re uh, retired and was terminally uh, terminally ill she confessed to sandy her feelings for teddy lloyd and how she camouflaged her affections by entering into a relationship with mr lowther she died believing that it was a personal life which made one of her favorite peoples betray her to the authorities it was not actually her personal life that made the, one of the girls betray her it was actually her fa fascistic tendencies that made the girls betray her one of the girls betray her in chapter 4 you see the brody set in senior school and miss brody is no longer the deity presiding over them uh, they've gone to higher grade and uh, miss brody is not their teacher anymore the senior school teachers are immersed in their fields of specialization and show no interest in the personalities of their pupils Mary McGregor takes fright during an experiment that involves magnesium flares and runs panic-stricken between benches, only to be met by tongues of flame wherever she goes. So Mary McGregor, who we read earlier, dies in a uh, fire in a hotel. Now, uh, when she was in higher grade in school, in a science uh, lab, the when she saw fire, you know, resulting out from resulting from one of the experiments she became so frightened and she was running around the lab screaming with fear and the teacher uh, miss lockhart the science teacher took uh, took quite a long time to uh, calm her down and you know uh, make that girl uh, you know be more settled she was petrified otherwise she was petrified of uh, fire so kind of foreshadows you know what's going to happen to her in her later life now miss mckay the headmistress was particularly pleased that in senior school the brody said did not have miss uh, brody around any more to keep them directions she laid a scheme to finally disperse this group and rid the school of miss brody she tried to use mary to talk about miss brody but mary was too dumb to understand her probing questions and miss mckay's pla plans failed Now the girls still maintained their loyalty to Miss Brody and kept her well informed about all that happened in class. Miss Brody, on the other hand, related to them the domestic crisis that Mr. Lowther, the music teacher, was going through. His housekeeper had deserted him, and the Misses Ellen and Alison Kerr, the junior school sewing teacher, sewing mistresses, had taken on the temporary task of running Mr. Lowther's household. So. Uh, the girls uh, still had loyalty towards uh, miss brody and they visited her and she would tell them what was happening in the household of mr lowther and he had lost his housekeeper and he was going through a difficult period of time and uh, miss gaunt actually encourages the two junior sewing mistresses to go to lowther's house and clean it up and cook and uh, you know take care of the house for him so miss gaunt encouraged this so that they could know what was happening in the lowther's house miss brody's pattern of life was well set now every sunday would be spent at mr lowther's house more often than not even the night her heart was with mr lloyd the art teacher but she gave herself to the singing master on the rebound out of a sense of duty and martyrdom she knew she could never openly flaunt her affection for the married mr lloyd as this was a sort of relationship that would be frowned upon by the society when she felt that the curs were not taking care of mr lowther 43 year old uh, miss brody cast social niceties to the wind and moved in with mr lowther to her girls though she gave the impression that she went back to her own lodgings each night 
also uh, when miss brody felt that these sewing mistresses were not doing a good job of taking care of mr lauter she moved in to mr lauter's house herself but she did not tell she stayed the night also spent the nights with mr lauter but she did not tell this to her girls who visited her when the girls came to visit her miss brody would show a subtle interest in the preoccupation of mr loy and sandy having divined having understood the real, true nature of her affections would often relate news about it so sandy would tell her all the news about the art master it was she who described the warm and conventional atmosphere in this house his six children his roman catholic faith his wife deidre and gave the surprising news that rose stanley modeled for his portraits so rose was modeling for his portrait Sandy was the one who came and told her all this information. In Chapter Five, uh, Miss Brody's passions for Mr. Lloyd is not one-sided. His response and reaction to her is conveyed through his art. No matter who the model and what the scene, Lloyd's portraits have a peculiar propensity. They all portray Miss Brody, whose features he is able to transpose onto the face of anyone who might actually sit for him. so this is how we know that mr lloyd also loves miss brody whoever he paints whichever model sits in front of him when he paints all of them would begin to look like miss brody so we understand that he was also very much in love with her because of this and sandy understands this you know sandy with her keen insight is very intelligent she understands it. can perceive the transference of lloyd's hidden affection for miss brody to his creative works so uh, his uh, Uh, he transfers his love for miss brody onto his paintings when told by mr lloyd that he intended to paint the entire brody set together sandy's remarks we look like one miss big brody i suppose so see this is how he uh, replies to him then he says that i would like to paint all of you together the whole brody set together and sandy replies that if you do that we will all look like one giant mix miss brody Uh, mr lloyd understanding mr lloyd understanding her meaning kisses her passionately much later he embarks on a brief affair with sandy breaking miss brody's plans for the future of sandy and rose uh, miss brody had actually intended for uh, for mr lloyd to have an affair with rose uh, and sandy to be the one who would bring her the information but that doesn't happen just the reverse of that happens mr lloyd has an affair not with rose but with sandy and it becomes rose who carries the information back to miss brody so she has mistakenly imagined that she would preside over mr lloyd's liaison a relationship with rose and sandy would serve as her informant on the affair it turns out to be the other way from here begins her downfall that culminates in her betrayal so this is a point from it uh her downfall or rather she loses her influence over the girls and ends uh, in being expelled or fired from the school uh, mr lauter who after 2 years of miss brody's companionship chooses to forsake her and marries miss lockhart the science teacher so though they had such a close relationship mr uh, lauter understands that Miss Brody is not really deeply in uh, love with or committed to him, and so he uh, rejects her and marries Miss Lockhart, the science teacher. Now this news comes as a shock to Miss Jean Brody. Sadly, Sandy understands that Lauter was a proxy through whom Miss Brody satisfies her sexual yearnings, and it is then that she sees the hypocrisy of the figure. who the brody set wrongly admired and tried to emulate all these many years so uh, <clears throat> uh lauta was just being taken advantage of right uh, lauta was not the man who miss jean brody really loved it was mr lloyd but then she just takes advantage of mr lauta for satisfying her sexual uh, desires so sandy understands this and uh, she also understands that this woman miss jean brody whom they had all admired for so many years seems to be such a hypocrite chapter 6 miss brody seems 
past her prime as far as her teaching goes miss brody takes oh. a new girl uh miss brody takes a new girl joyce emily hammond uh, under her wing joyce emily a congenital rebel and troublemaker has a history of school expulsions behind her by now the brody set had changed too Eunice practiced swimming and diving with her boyfriend. Monica and Mary had taken to community service and went to the slums with groceries. Jenny, discovering her dramatic talent, rehearsed incessantly for her school dramatic society. Rose continued to model for Mr. Lloyd and was occasionally accompanied there by Sandy. So she had taken on a new student, you know, Joyce Emily Hammond under her wing. And Joyce uh, Emily was a. Uh, 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 congenital like uh, had a history of being a troublemaker and had been expelled from several schools uh, but then uh, she was a student uh, who was now taken into control by miss brody because other girls had all grown up and they had their own interests to pursue uh, before finishing school mary became a short hand typist and jenny joined a school for dramatics school of dramatics before others finished school and then went their different ways unis began to learn modern languages but finally became a nurse monica took science sandy preferred psychology and rose who was much sought after by boys got married soon after so this was the future of those girls in chapter 6 uh, sandy's interest in psychology had to do <coughs> with the chief preoccupation of her life the painter's mind of teddy lloyd and the scheming mind of miss broad so sandy became more and more interested in psychology because she was always thinking of you know the mind what was miss brody thinking about uh, how did she uh, conduct this relationship with mr lloyd so the details of you know uh, teddy lloyd his uh, art and how he was he showed his love to miss uh, jean brody by painting pictures that look like her right and uh, and how miss brody plotted and planned to be close to him in ways that was not easily visible so sandy's interest in psychology developed from uh, understanding trying to understand all this the latter still reveled in knowing that lloyd's portraits carried the unmistakable stamp of her appearance but was magnanimous enough to suggest to sandy that she wanted rose to take her place in the artist's heart so she did, she was miss brody was still happy that uh, no matter who uh, is the model when mr lloyd paints they all become images of miss jean brody nevertheless she tells sandy that i would like rose to take my place It was with shock surprise that he learned of the reversal of roles that she had envisaged for Sandy and Rose. Uh, it was Sandy who had become Lloyd's lover, and it was Rose who was her informant about it. Now, in her obsession to understand Lloyd's mind, Sandy had undertaken to understand his faith in Roman Catholicism. She extracted his religion as a pith from a husk. her mind was as full of his religion as a night sky is full of things visible and invisible so um, sandy was attracted to that element of religion in this art teacher the element of roman catholicism in this art teacher and she just uh, tried to uh, you know soak it up completely the, the religion of the art teacher is what she soaked up completely just as the night sky is full of visible and invisible things she soaked up everything now she left the man later on sandy left the man took his religion and then became a nun in the course of time so what stayed with her of her relationship with mr lloyd was the fact that she took the religion became closer to the religion and became a nun later on in life sandy learned from miss brody that the latter regretted having inspired young joyce and me to go to spain and join the civil war on the side of general franco so uh, miss brody in her usual way had actually uh, prompted the young joyce and me to go to spain to join in the civil war but unfortunately she met with an accident uh, before she could reach that place uh, on the train uh, she was uh, in a terrible train uh, 
in a tragedy in an accident she was killed and um, uh, sandy hears about this from miss brody herself and sandy holds miss brody responsible for the death of joyce emily to go to spain uh sandy determined that miss brody no longer did deserve to continue teaching at marsha blake she got down to the self assigned task of having miss brody dismissed from the school uh, through miss mackay the girl put her plan into action miss brody was forced to retire in 1939 on grounds that she had been teaching fascism she rejected and isolated miss brody died just after the second world war never knowing uh with certainty the true identity of a betrayer so it was sandy you know the last straw was the death of uh, emily and uh, sandy conspires with mackay uh, and the charge on miss brody is that she had not been teaching the girls uh, the required curriculum instead she had been teaching the girls about fascism which was a terrible charge especially in those days and that was how she was fired from the school and to her death she did not know which of the brody set had actually uh, given her up now sandy later to become sister helena uh, analyzes brody's ultimate downfall as a consequence of her political ideology rather than as a punishment for her unconventional love life so though she uh, though jean brody herself thinks that it is her unconventional love life that made the girls betray her we know that sandy had betrayed her because of the political ideology because of the way in which she seemed to favor fascism apart from sandy who understood and put a stop to the sinister machinations of brody the rest of the brody set continued to admire their teacher much after her death though she admits that miss jean brody had been a main influence in her life sister helena remarks that it's only possible to betray where loyalty is due so it's only possible to betray uh, the word betray can be used only where there is loyalty a sense of loyalty and for miss jean brody uh, sister helena says loyalty was due and justified only up to a point beyond that point it was not she was not the serving of the loyalty of the brody set so that is why sandy uh, betrays her and gets her fired from the school so that is uh, how the novel is then uh, we have to do uh, some analysis of the novel yeah so uh, the first part there are two parts you know analyzing the text is uh, given in your book as two parts the first part sparks uh, narrative technique okay so what is the narrative technique of spark now in the brevity of art muriel spark is a writer who values brevity in art okay uh, brevity in art means she is brief in what she says sometimes it's more powerful when you say what you have to say in less number of words you know than using 100 words to say what you have to say using a few words that are apt that are powerful makes more of an impact so muriel spark is a writer who values brevity in art in her writings she focuses on a small group of characters who have some shared interest though this tendency limits the plot as well as activities of characters it's ideal for bringing out some kind of truth that spark believes must emerge out of fiction the reader is subtly invited to assess miss brody as a woman in her prime and as a person who endeavors to hone her favorite students into the creme de la creme of society from the interaction of the girls with their teacher emerges this inex inexplicable fatalistic hold that miss brody exercises over the brody set so uh i mean she believed in brevity in art so the plot and the activities of the character is presented very briefly by her but then it is also a kind of writing which is ideal for bringing out uh, some kind of truth and in this one it is the truth of who miss brody really is and the 
oh and the fears like and the uh, deep uh, influence that she has over the girls so how he seems to be misusing it now another uh, characteristic of uh, the text is that it contains a narrative within a narrative uh, within the main narrative two of miss brodie's girls sandy and jenny create another narrative theirs is a fictional account of miss brodie's love life and is written in the style of sir walter scott and r l stevenson whose works the girls have been reading now this pattern of narrative within narrative admirably conveys the psychology of young girls who are exposed to romantic fiction ignorant and curious about sex and exulting in the melodrama you know whatever fantasies they have about sex uh, they let it loose in their uh, fictional writing so uh, the writer seems to be employing a technique of narrative within a narrative uh, just like in hamlet you find a play within a play the time sequence now uh, time sequence is not linear at all the chronology and time sequence are consciously rejected by uh, the author the omniscient narrator knowing all about the past the present and the future of the protagonist deftly handles the time phases by practicing a kind of flash forward technique okay uh, like you know you are given uh, you given flash forward what is going to happen in the future a uh, flash forward technique is used so uh, the omniscient narrator seems to know everything about the characters and what will be happening to them and what has already happened to them so this involves a narration that the, that first describes how the protagonists shape up in their adulthood and in the future so first we are told about how, what happens in the future spark often resorts to presenting insightful flashes that not only look forward to the future flashing forward but also help us in better comprehending the present in the novel so Uh, looking forward to the future and also understanding what is happening in the present she she presents these uh, uh, flashes you know flashing forward into the future the literary term for that is prolepsis and flashing backwards is analepsis two terms you can uh, you know learn it prolepsis and analepsis so she often employs uh, prolepsis in her writing that is flashing forward in into a future point of time <clears throat> uh, the narrative is interspersed with many an account in which the present is understood more clearly through events that materialized in the future so to understand the present you know we are also taken to the future and told about what happens in the future uh, spark recounts a highly individualistic temperaments and tendencies of the brody certain senior school they wear their school hats in every manner but the proper one an example that they've given here is how the girls wear their hats uh, they are supposed to wear their hats in a particular manner but these girls brodie's girls they never wear it in the right manner each of the six has her own area of interest and possess individual qualities which are acknowledged later in life miss brodie teaches them in an unconventional manner walks in on forbidden areas talks about her life experiences etc so all of these go in shaping the mentalities of the girls and decides what they are going to do in future the novel deals with the theme of non conformity specifically breaking away from the traditional methods of education the denouma of the novel denouma where everything is resolved can be understood through sandy who understands miss brodie's hold over the students and wants to free them from their teacher's sinister machinations the she who becomes mr lloyd's lover and relegates the beautiful rose to being a mere painter's model a betrayal of miss brodie is a vindication of her ability to assess situations and meet out justice so sandy is the only one who is unable to understand uh, the truth of uh, miss jean brodie and she kind of you know uh, reverses the roles and she uh, once she understands who miss jean brody really is and what she has been really doing she turns the tables on her and she is the one who meets out justice to her who uh, succeeds in getting her fired from school the tall the dull uh, clumsy and incompetent mary mcgregor dies tragically in a hotel fire 
the same girl who was running in the science laboratory getting very scared when she saw the flames in the scientific experiment so she uh, dies tragically in a hotel fire as she can only run from one end of a smoky corridor to another at school mary can only scream helplessly while the rest of the class completes an experiment with magnesium flares her terror while others work symbolically foreshadows her death so it's kind of you know foreshadowing uh, kind of uh, telling us of what is going to come uh, in future by creating a parallel situation in this manner spark is able to highlight the character of mary and as well as create extra uh, an extra dimension in the narrative texture so foreshadowing creates an extra dimension in the narrative texture the novel opens with brody set as 16 years a uh, 16 year old chatting self consciously with some school boys it then describes the special aptitudes of each of the girls before plunging back to their past 6 years before when they had first been put in charge of this brody now from then on there is a constant flux in terms of the time sequence as narrative splits between the protagonist's immediate past and their distant futures Uh, by first presenting the future and then interconnecting it to the past muriel spark gives us a clearer picture of character and situation so uh, like we discussed in the beginning you know the, these novel is a postmodernist novel is a play around with time and here also you find that uh, time sequences uh, you know always in a flux right the time sequence and the narrative all keeps shifting Uh, so that you know we get a clearer picture of what has happened in a particular situation and its repercussions its impacts later on like most of muriel sparks works this novel is written in the third person focuses on views held by central figures miss brody and sandy through them the author accentuates the contradictions and later uh, the conflicts that arise when both perceive differently the role that a teacher should and does play in the molding of pupils both represent different versions of similar experience and uh, unresolved conflicts that result uh, and gives a novel shades of the novo roma modern novel Uh, this clash between the two divergent ideologies result in sandy exposing miss brody's uh, fascistic tendencies to the administrators so that is about the uh, narrative side of the novel now the plot the plot revolves around a small group of characters comprising of miss brody her special set of girls uh, hello yes ma'am i think someone else is presenting uh can you still see my screen no ma'am i think it is stopped no yeah. no ma'am no ma'am no. someone is disturbing yeah, let me let me start presenting again let's start broadcast I think someone else started presenting in the screen, and uh, I lost my presentation. Let me go back. Huh? Yes. Can you see it now? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. Going back to the yes. uh, slide here. Yes, ma'am. Now we were talking about the uh, plot here. Okay. So this plot, the plot of this novel, uh, revolves around a small group of characters. which comprise miss brody and her special set of six girls then there is mr lloyd the art master mr louther the singing master uh, the action within the novel is limited and restricted to the intermingling of these few characters the central thematic concern around which the action takes place has to do with the identification of fraud and humbug that miss brody exercises so that is the uh, central theme you know uh, to find out to understand uh, and react to the uh, humbug uh, you know to the hypocrisy that is uh, practiced by miss brody <clears throat> it's a world of marcia blaine school which has one teacher miss brody standing apart from the rest of the staff that muriel spark portrays by constantly harping upon her undeclared war with miss mackey 
the headmistress over her unconventional methods of teaching miss brody wins the sympathy and unwavering loyalty of her girls they look upon her as an unusual adult who delights in breaking conventions by describing to them her traumatic love life her sensitivity to art and music her defiance of social norms her glorious dreams of molding their destinies in the future she does however practice a measure of caution when she falls in love with mr lloyd though seen being kissed by him she never acknowledges the true nature of her feelings for him till as long as her girls are in school in fact to camouflage her feelings she takes to living with mr lawther and faces the ignominy of him jilting her and marrying mrs lockhart the science teacher so um she uh, though she has this, uh, you know deep love for mr lloyd she does not want to break the laws of society because he is already married and so she uh, enters into a relationship with mr lock uh, lawther although later on she has to face this ignominy the steep humiliation of being jilted by him of being turned uh, 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 turned away by him jilted means to not being reciprocated in terms of love you know and uh, him marrying the science teacher out of all her proteges it is the ugly sandy who is able to perceive hidden aspects of miss brody's personality so of all the girls it is miss uh, it is sandy who understands miss jody's personality and it is she who looks through mr lloyd's portraits and identifies striking similarities in all of them no matter who models all his portraits end up in faces that bear a remarkable re- resemblance to miss brody this discovery reinforces her suspicions uh, and rega- regarding the true nature of her teacher's affection and establishes the fraud and humbug that miss brody indulges in okay so sandy understands that all along the brodies that had been deceived into believing miss brody's grand passion for mr lawther and that it was mr lloyd who really had her heart so there uh, you know the image that the girls had uh, about miss uh, jean brody crumbles especially in sandy's eyes because she is able to understand that it's quite hypocritical in the the way in which miss jean brody uh, has this relationship with lawther which which is almost like a a, a rebound relationship Sandy breaks Miss Brody's cherished dreams of including Rose, uh, or in sorry, include uh, inducing Rose to be Mr. Lloyd's lover, and Sandy with her insight to be her informant on the affair. So uh, Brody's plans are shattered by Sandy. As it turns out, it was Sandy who becomes the art master's lover, and Rose who carries information about the affair. and she begins to see brody in a negative light as being one who equates herself with god and providence and views herself as a deity that presides over the lives of others so as one who is exercising uh, her influence over the girls to decide what they do right acting god for the girls nobody has a right to do that right nobody has a right to decide things for others so sandy begins to see brody in a different light not as their uh, uh, protector or savior but rather as the one who is making them behave like she wants them to behave like acting like god miss brody had encouraged emily to join in a war but the girl died in a train crash on the way to the battlefront and sandy on hearing this information decides that now miss brody was too dangerous to be allowed to be continued To, uh, to be allowed to continue as a teacher molding young minds and sandy sees miss brody's revolutionary methods and ideology as deliberate attempts to legitimize the immoral and the fraudulent so she doesn't even teach the curriculum she teaches them whatever she wants to so sandy is now find uh, having a another look at whatever miss brody has done and she realizes uh, the teacher is too dangerous to allow Uh, to be allowed to continue teaching till the end of her life miss brody is left to ruminate to think ruminate about the identity of her betrayer whom she realizes must be one of the brody set she doesn't know who it is that it is sandy actually who does the deed in the novel it can be discerned in the tension between conventional doctrines and progressive methods of education the resolution of the conflict emerges at the climax where the character's moral awakening helps him or her 
in evaluating the authenticity of the conflicting perspectives provided by the other campuses so, so this is how you know the, the resolution in the conflict comes then see one of the characters moral awakening in this case sandy sandy's awakening helps her in evaluating the situation uh, evaluating the authenticity of this conflicting perspective provided by the other character and she takes actions for that that is how we get the resolution in this novel the characterization now as her early novels try to portray psychological and moral growth sparks characters are interiorized this means that they are involved in the search for a self that accommodates both personal fulfillment and political or social claims these characters are usually guided by personal obsessions that turn their lives into channels of self righteous imagination and bring about their destruction this is what happens to miss brody also right she is so focused on her own thoughts and ideologies that uh, it actually leads to her own destruction Miss Brody is one such character. See, an eccentric spinster and school teacher, she has made a fine art out of private judgment of character, and specializes in organizing the lives of the Brody set according to her own insight, which she has no right to do. She negates and scoffs at any inculcation of the team spirit, which in her eyes contravenes individual freedom. That is why uh, uh, she. dislikes the girls joining the girl guides right she doesn't want any team spirit to come in because she feels that will uh, prevent the girls from developing their own individual freedom at the same time uh, she is not actually giving the girls their individual freedom she is the one who decides how they act so that that is you know the the, the complexity in the character of miss teen brody Now, this impression of her power is also carried by her pupils, who are unquestioning and uncritical and absorbing all that she says. She derives her power from two sources. One emanates from those parents who could be trusted not to lodge complaints about the more advanced and seditious aspects of her educational policy. So, uh, the girls absorb everything that she says. They don't question her. They don't understand her until Sandy understands. Uh, and she gets her power from two sources one from the parents who never complain about her seditious the, the divisive educational policy that she is practicing the other was a personal equation that she shares with the girls themselves with the brody set where their parents hesitated to take them miss brody was a willing escort for example taking the girls to uh, the poorer uh, poor suburbs of edinburgh by inviting them for meals and walks Miss Brody inculcated in the girls a sense of indebtedness, which she used to her advantage and self-protection against the school authorities. Uh, her manipulations regarding the future of especially two girls, Rose and Sandy, in order to make Rose Mr. Lloyd's lover, she identifies Rose's instinct uh, would particularly appeal to the art master and tries to convince Sandy that she be the ideal informant on the Lloyd Rose liaison. so now now you see very clearly how she is manipulating uh, her role as a manipulator how she tries to build this relationship between uh, lloyd the teacher and rose uh, the student uh, so uh, i mean for her like i mean uh, it is sandy actually who ends up becoming the lover and uh, thus uh, seems to completely you know uh, topple or reverse the plans that uh, miss teen brody had miss brody's relationship with lautha also cannot stand the test of time uh, because it starts on a note of deceit and fraud as mr lautha is only a smoke screen like a smoke screen like the octopus is sending out the smoke screen to protect themselves you know mr lautha was just a smoke sc- a smoke screen to camouflage the real love that miss brody felt for mr lloyd which was a forbidden passion she keeps mr lauther on tenter hooks you know dangling him along and then begins to treat him with indifference believing all the while that she could marry him whenever she pleased and when he gets engaged to miss lockhart the science mistress there is great sense of shock and humiliation now miss brody's own fascistic leanings can be seen in her endeavor to cultivate and thrust her own passions on the mind of her special girls 
she looks upon girl guides as a rival group she does not understand she is indulging herself at the expense of the freedom of others now this is the threatening aspect of her personality which sums up her abuse of power ultimately she is reduced to a pathetic creature who loses her power and cannot understand why those very individuals whom she had nurtured so carefully let her down another character who uh, exhibits propensities of psychological and moral growth is sandy okay uh, she like miss brody is involved in a search for self which leads her through many divisive ex- diverse experiences and culminates in her taking the vows of a nun Uh, Sandy is, however, the foil created by Spark to offset Brody. So, uh, a foil is a character who kind of offsets the other character. Okay, every character uh, to shine or to not shine will have another opposite character. So, here Sandy is the foil uh, to offset Brody, and she is seen to undertake a personal mission that initially questions, then defies, and ultimately betrays Miss Brody for what she is. When Jenny reports seeing Miss Brody being kissed by Lloyd in the art room uh, after school, Sandy begins to see the sexual aspect of Miss Brody's love life. She's the only one in the Brody set who's able to identify the image of the teacher in any figure that Mr. Lloyd claims to paint. With Emily Joyce's tragic death, while the girl was on way to fight for General Franco in the Spanish Civil War. uh sandy's conscience is jolted into action spark allies herself in some aspects with sandy who then enters a convent and publishes a psychological treatise called the transfiguration of the common place though sandy is seen to have meted out justice given justice she herself is not a figure who is totally redeemed of creed you know she feels some sort of guilt in too many ways she bears an interior resemblance to mr brody and we are made to see her anxieties as a nut although she has given up um, uh, her life uh, uh, and become a nun you know we still see that you know sandy is fighting with her own identities with with her own identity which seems to be quite similar to that of miss brody at the fag end of their lives both miss brody and sandy are figures of isolation in contrast to the centrality of miss brody and sandy the other characters are peripheral and as far as characterization is concerned most importance is given to miss brody and sandy the other characters are only in the outer layers in the peripheral layers uh, they only serve to highlight the interaction between the two main protagonists the girls in the brody set monica douglas rose stanley yunus gardner jenny gray and mac mary mcgregor symbolically emphasize the strength of miss brody's personality mr lloyd the art master and mr lauter the singing teacher are the only two males that we encounter directly in the text they are shown to be satellites of miss brody who only serves uh, to fulfill her emotional and physical means emotionally she is in love with mr lloyd and physically it is lauter who satisfies her sexual urges she can never publicly display her true affections for mr lloyd which would be seen in an adulterous light her intimacy with mr lauter is known but as there is never any material evidence miss brody only escapes with social censure social criticism contrasted with the central characters the central figures the other personalities seem insipid and uninspiring so no other characters are given as much importance as these two uh, characters uh, they are deliberately portrayed in this manner to highlight the strength and thereby the weakness of miss brody and sandy so uh, you know the other uh, characters uh, are presented uh, very in a very weak light so that you know miss brody and sandy really stand out their, their characters are highlighted and uh, spark's manner of characterization is both witty and sardonic it conveys the author's capacity to observe and analyze different levels of human relationships so uh, very witty characterization sardonic ca- characterization presenting people in various levels of relationships 
then we have to see what are the elements you know analyzing the text section 2 we have to see what are the different elements of autobiography that you can find in this novel so what are the different elements of autobiography you see here in her autobiography curriculum vitae spark recounts her days at the james uh, gillespie high school for girls in edinburgh she begins by describing how prosperous tradesmen from the 16th century onwards took a keen interest in founding schools in this city the author spent 12 years at the school and it is her experiences there that go into the writing of the crime of miss jean brody the central figure of miss brody in the novel is based on the personality of miss christina k so the character of miss jean brody is based on one of her own teachers in her school james chilesty school and the name of this teacher is miss christina k one of spark's favorite teachers the name brody however has been borrowed from a young american woman charlotte brody who taught the author to read at the age of 3 so the name was from another uh, lady who was also kind of a teacher and uh, the character is based on another uh, teacher who taught her at school okay the teacher's name is christina k uh miss k entered the author's imagination through gripping accounts of her travels through europe and egypt her admiration for italian painters like leonardo leonardo da vinci botticelli giotto fra le polipi her fascination for the cult of masolini's fascist type uh, her dramatic method of instruction in which shapes sculptures arithmetical problems linguistic points move easily around each other and the strong views on education which she believed was a leading out of what was there already rather than a putting in so kind of like miss brody says right about what is education a leading out uh, the fictional miss brody's ideas about education bear a remarkable similarity to the real miss k's perceptions about the same subject miss k ardently attended lectures at the university of edinburgh and other institutions on such diverse subjects as theology art german poetry health and beauty care and most of what she absorbed was shared with her class in the novel miss prodi follows a similar method miss k had a knack of gaining our entire sympathy whatever her views right spark in curriculum vitae she successfully able to transpose this ability onto miss prodi within the novel this particular knack is miss brody's greatest strength and also her greatest weakness so whatever uh, she hears she transfers to the girls uh, this was uh, uh, something that her teacher used to do and she transfers the same thing to her character in the novel but if we assume that christina k is the exact of miss jean brody we are wrong okay there are however differences between the real and the fictional fictional characters spark emphasizes this in curriculum vitae so this is what spark writes in a sense miss k was nothing like miss brody she was far far above and beyond her uh, brody counterpart if she could have met miss brody miss k would have put the fictional character firmly in her place uh, that is that is a quote from uh, the book Uh, okay so uh, in reality uh miss k was nothing like miss brody and if uh, miss k had met miss brody she would have put miss brody in her place this is what uh, muriel spark writes now miss brody's unconventional love life in the novel did not in any way reflect aspects in miss k's life miss k's life is Uh, there's no connection okay between uh, this uh, love life in miss brody's uh, life with what had happened in miss k's life miss k was about 50 years old in 1929 when she taught spark and the author suggests that there had been a man in her teacher's uh, earlier life who could have died in the terrible carnage of the 1914 to 1918 war uh, then Uh, another uh, other parallels that you find, you know, with in her autobiography that we can link up with the novel. See, Mr. Vishart, Spark singing master, and Mr. Gordon, the history master, serve as inspiration and models for the creation of Mr. Lowther. 
Mr. Lauther's playing with Jenny's uh, curls reflects a trait that he shared with Mr. Gordon, the history master, who indulged in similar practice in class by stroking young, young Sparks' hair. The author's handsome art master, Arthur Kaulik, finds his fictional counterpart in Mr. Lloyd. Spark learned from the rudiments. Uh, uh, Spark learned about the rudiments of sex through a brief friendship with Daphne Porter and the long-lasting bond with Francis Niven. In the novel, it is the Sandy Jenny Association that is uh, reflected. You know that this thing is reflected. Edinburgh of 1930s is sketched with sensitivity. Miss Brodie takes her girls for walks in the town. The economic depression of the time is reflected in the slums of Old Town with its long lines of unemployed people waiting for their dole, then uh, the rampant alcoholism, the violence of the general air of poverty reflected in the unshod children, the shoeless children playing in the cold winds. More than any of the others, it is Sandy who sees and responds to these realities that lie outside the ambit of middle class existence outside the scope of middle-class existence. In Curriculum Vitae, Muriel Spark is able to recreate that atmosphere and the people she interacted with, especially those at James Gillespie High School for girls. After reading her autobiography, we can say that much of the prime of Miss Jean Brody is a fictional account of the teachers and friends of Spark's own childhood. Then uh, the other topic here is perspectives on faith. So, uh, what, what are the perspectives on faith that we should understand? Okay, Politics faded from fiction written during and after the First World War. It was replaced by greater concentration on some religious and moral issues. The prime of Miss Jean Brodie touches upon both. And then uh, Miss Brodie and Sandy are reflected the diverse threads of Christianity. These two characters, Miss Jean Brody and Sandy, you can see diverse threads of religion uh, reflected, uh, diverse threads of Christianity actually reflected. The teacher's attitude is related to Calvinism, while the student's ideology is steeped in Roman Catholicism. So the two follow different kinds, uh, different uh, aspects of Christianity. Uh, now, a little bit about Roman uh, Catholicism. See, according to uh, ancient tradition, St. Peter, the chief apostle of Christ, founded the Christian church at Rome. The bishops of Rome since then have claimed for their office a direct succession from St. Peter and have come to be called, called as popes. Uh, the pope is the head of the Roman Catholic Church and he resides in Vatican City in Rome. Right? This much we all know. The church believes that in matters of faith and morals, the teachings of the church are infallible. This means that they are free from all possibility of error. It thereby follows that when the Pope, speaking in his apostolic capacity, makes a pronouncement in matters of faith and morals, his teachings uh, is also infallible. So they can go no, they cannot go wrong. That is what the Roman Catholics believe. Okay, when the Pope speaks. That is ultimate word. It's like the word of God. Reformation or the birth of Protestantism marked the break away from Roman Catholic Church. Uh, during the Reformation, or uh, uh, when Protestantism took uh, uh, originated, you know, we can say it marked a break from Roman Catholic Church. And this took place in Europe uh, during the 16th century. In Germany, you know, it began in Germany when Martin Luther King, uh, sorry, not Martin Luther King, Martin Luther, a minor son who had become a priest, preached against granting of indulgences by the Pope. So this is how it started. In Germany, Martin Luther, who was a minor son, uh, he became a priest and he preached against granting of uh, indulgences by the Pope. Uh, indulgences, you know, uh, like if somebody had committed a big crime and, and if they were rich enough, they could go buy an indulgence from the Rome. By giving money to church, they could buy a, an indulgence which would absolve them from whatever crime that they had committed. So uh, Martin Luther preached against such indulgences. So indulgences are pardons given in exchange for money. 
he drew attention by nailing a protest to the church door at Wittenberg. He was condemned as a heretic and excommunicated by the church in Rome. So naturally, if you go against the religion, right, they are excommunicated. Immediately, the Church of Rome excommunicated Martin Luther. Uh, Luther realized he could not reform the existing Catholic Church. And he formulated uh, in the Augsburg Confession of 1530 the basis of a new doctrine that broke away from Roman Catholicism. So he formulated a, a, a new a new kind of, uh, you know, religious practice which broke away from uh, Roman Catholicism. Now in England, this is what happened in Germany. In England, the Reformation started when Henry VIII in 1534 threw off the authority of the Pope and declared himself the head of the church. Henry VIII, uh, when he wanted to marry Anne Boleyn, Right. He could not, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so uh, he could not marry her because he, the Church of Rome, could not give him a divorce, and so he just uh, declared uh, Engl the England free from the authority of the Pope, and he broke away. And that is how Protestant they were protesting against the authority of the Pope, and that's how Protestantism was uh, born in England. Uh, then he had six wives, and really eight, uh, six wives. And all of them uh, were killed by him, except for the sixth one. And she lived because she outlived him. He died before her. So in England, the Reformation started when Henry VIII in 1534 threw off the authority of the Pope and declared himself the head of the church. And the Reformation became firmly established in England during the reign of Elizabeth I. Now, John Calvin uh, was a Swiss religious reformer who was greatly influenced by Luther's doctrines. One of the controversial aspects of his teaching was a code of simplicity and austerity, which he urged people to follow in both everyday life and church ritual. So Calvinism denies the individual free will and sees all events as predestined or predetermined. So uh, uh, someone who really uh, supported Martin Luther's uh, doctrines, you know, was the Swiss religious reformer called John Calvin. And in his uh, religious uh, doctrines, he believed that, you know, all the events are predetermined or predestined and individual will does not have much role to play in it. So this, this is what forms the basis of Calvinistic thought. And uh, John Knox, a Scottish reformer and preacher, furthered this Calvinistic form of Protestantism. His triumph was achieved in 1560 when, by the Treaty of Edinburgh, papal authority was abolished in Scotland and replaced by Calvinistic confession of faith drawn up by Knox and his colleagues. So Miss Brodie's religious leanings are distinctly Calvinistic, whereas Sandy's is Roman Catholic. So there is her disapproval of Church of Rome, which she considers to be the church of superstition, believes that only people who did not think for themselves were Roman Catholics. As a thinking individual, she distances herself from Roman Catholic Church and becomes, as Sandy says, the god of Calvin, who sees the beginning and the end. So she uh, denies individualistic will to people who are her supporters or people who follow her, people who listen to her, just like the Calvinistic God. That is what Sandy says. Imbued with the sense of omnipotence, she sets about ordering her own life and also that of others. So that is how this Calvinistic uh, ideology is what actually makes her think that she can take control of the lives of the girls who are loyal to her. Uh, Miss Brody's attitudes to education. By the way, we must not forget that uh, Burial Spark herself had converted to Roman Catholicism and she felt that she could write better after her conversion. So keep that in mind too. Miss Brody's attitudes to education are also related to Calvinism. She's like Calvin's God, holding sway over Bro Brody's set, expecting each of them to fulfill her expectations at each step of their lives. She then seeks to assure them of an academic salvation by promising to turn them into the creme de la creme among their peers if only they would follow her advice in letter and 
spirit. So denying them their individual freedom, you know, kind of predetermined or deterministic. She sets about planning and organizing their futures for them. It's Sandy who breaks her plans. So Sandy is the one who understands this and breaks the uh, set pattern. Miss Brody lives by personal insight and experience rather than by any theory and doctrine that and Sparks suggests that the Catholic Church was a suitable channel for normalizing her. So by presenting to us a character like Miss Jean Brody, whose uh, Calvinistic tendencies seem to derail her completely, uh, Muriel Sparks seems to be telling us that Catholic Church would have been the right avenue for normalizing her. And Sandy perceives the devastating effect of Miss Brody's imposition of personal ideology and enthusiasm, she understands the suffocating potential of her teachers. So she is the one who realizes, you know, how much uh, Miss Jean Brody's Calvinistic tendencies was uh, curtailing the free flight of the girls and their, uh, you know, individualistic ideas. Now, Calvinism's uh, deterministic streak is rejected by Sandy in favor of the more redemptive uh, Roman Catholicism. Uh, redemptive in the sense that which grants them freedom, more freedom, uh, either through confession or uh, penance. She visualizes Miss Brody as a Calvinistic presence designing and determining the future of innocent minds and vows to put a stop to it. And she achieves this end, uh, but at the cost of personal guilt that flays her constantly. That is why, you know, she has unresolved uh, feelings of guilt within her to the end to the last part because uh, she thinks that you know uh, she may have betrayed her teacher uh, she it makes her uneasy as a nun the other sympathies however lie with sandy so uh, muriel sparks sympathies lies with sandy and sandy recovers from her uh, place of <coughs> moral righteousness and looks back she realizes that miss brody's a defective sense of self-righteousness has not been without its beneficent and enlarging aspects. So looking back, you know, she does see the positive sides of uh, Miss Brody's influence also. Like Sandy, Muriel Spark personally rejects the determinism of Calvin and Knox in favor of the inclusiveness that she finds in Orthodox Catholicism. In the prime of Miss Jean Brody, Humbug and falsehood become the targets for, of her denunciation. So this, uh, you know, humbug hypocrisy that she's attacking in her novel. Then the issue of morality. <clears throat> uh, moral disturbance and degeneracy characterize uh, uh, Sparks' vision in the novel. Moral disarray is conveyed through the presentation of Miss Brody. She tries to weave model of psychological power and control over the destinies of others. But uh, her religious sensibility fails to provide her with clear moral perspective. At one point, the author intervenes openly to state that only the Roman Catholic Church could accommodate Miss Brody's extreme temperament. And Sandy is torn between ethics and imagination and resolves this internal conflict by giving weightage to ethics. So she knows this conflict between, you know, the sense of ethics, the sense of doing right, uh, the right thing at the right moment with what uh, imagination teaches. And she gives weightage to ethics. Miss Brody and Sandy are ironically involved in a common pursuit, the personal transfiguration of the commonplace. Miss Brody is involved in shaping the lives of her set while Sandy is preoccupied with art and imagination. Uh, she, that's how she tries to, you know, uh, in her relationship with the art master. She takes, she rejects the man and takes the religion. Through these characters, Spark is involved not only really in examining the relations between moral responsibility and the transforming imagination, but is also reiterating the connections between art and freedom and destiny. Now the uh, issue of uh, fascism. Sparks' scrutiny of moral concerns bring to the fore the struggle between good and evil. 
evil is shown to be the attempt to take over human beings and we see it in brody's exercise of moral and psychological power sandy's imaginative way of thinking makes her perceive that the brody set was miss brody's fascist style all knit together for her need so she understands you know the the uh, the evil in uh, this uh, concept you know of all the girls acting to the will of miss brody but she is able to understand why miss brody disapproves of the girl guides who she imagines are a threat to her hold over the brody set and miss brody's concept of education is ostensibly a leading out of what is already there in the pupil's soul but she dominates the girls rather than responding to their innate gifts this is the fault of miss jean brody dominating the girls manipulating them making them obey her will that is the fault that sandy sees that is a humbug that spark is denunciated she believes in enriching the lives of her students but paradoxically is resentful of their forming any attachment with their other mistresses in school this possessive attitude uh, along with her scorn for girls opting for the modern side rather than the classical and senior school show her in a negative light so she doesn't like the girls to become close to other teachers and she wants the girls to like the very subjects that she favors like the classic side rather than the modern side and like adult sipler's minister of propaganda gabels uh, miss brody fires imagination rather than the intellect so as a teacher she she fires imagination which is more opinion based rather than the intellect which would be more fact based her admiration for figures like mussolini and hitler further supplement her image as an ideologue of fascism as a supporter of fascism uh, the defeat of fascism and miss brody go together placing miss uh, the prime of miss jean brody within the historical space that it seeks to portray all around the world fascism is looked up down upon and so the defeat of miss jean brody is actually placing uh, the novel within the historical context that it's seeking to portray i hope that much is clear to you now we have to go to the last section here that is uh, just a brief history of the novels uh, the novel uh, is uh, 1960 uh, and after okay so this is the last uh, chapter in your book i'll just briefly go through this part also uh, i know it's been a long time but let's just try to read this part so that when you go back to your book it will become easy for you the novel in the 1960s so the fast changing socio political economic and cultural scenario during the 60s led to a consequential decade of remarkable literary achievements with the intensification of the cold war between two major superpowers america and soviet union russia first sending man into space americans landing on the moon the rising nuclear threat the vietnam war the broadening of the black power and the women's movement the phase of reality and history was completely changed irrevocably altered the breaking down of traditional uh, concepts of ethics and morality linear time book based culture made way for a new mode of life as a result there emerged the culture of rock music psychedelic colors of radical theater alternative press liberal sex and offbeat social cultural and political behavior all these gradually acquired a new prominence now this question of form in literature and art attracted critical attention of the artist who was impelled to explore new styles of expression that suited his post modern trends that they were able to notice in life and art uh, and as far as language is concerned see the philosophy of structuralism and deconstruction <clears throat> hello can you hear me yes ma'am okay yes ma'am okay yes ma'am uh, all right uh, so the philosophy of structuralism and deconstruction challenged the old modes of literary expression literature was now reduced to the problematics of language uh, they were more concerned with the issue of writing itself and with locating the world into the text and the text into the world the writer could not locate himself or herself in the text as 
she herself or he herself were, was being written by the language language was shaping the very writers who were writing so it became you know put, placing the text in the world and the world in the text with the new popularity of literary theory traditional concepts of plot and character and chronology practiced till the 50s were rejected the british novel came to make acquaintance with metafiction uh, that involved the intermingling of style form and tradition the interaction between literature and other subjects and the new focus on the problematics of language all that became you know part of this uh, novel in the 60s okay what was happening in the 60s in the writings of angus wilson doris lessing muriel spark anthony burgers and iris murdock all of whom continued to write well into the 1960s british fiction opened to new experiences and newer modes of expression Doris Lessing's a golden notebook John Foles a French le lieutenant's woman by the way lieutenant if it is british pronunciation lieutenant if it is american mm -hmm. uh, largely represents the british novel of the 1960s the portrait of the woman painted as the central character broaches the issues of self and discourse and the intermixing of historical and personal political and aesthetic codes and uh, john fowles established himself with this short novel the collector in 1963 but made his real mark with the french uh, lieutenant swimmer uh, they stand in the at the intersection of the novel and the anti novel and herald a new generation of writers announcing the arrival of experimental fiction now prominent among those who took such writings are christina brook rose and quinn john berger eva figs uh, paul scott angela carter alan sheridan another version of the post modernist trend is to be found in the anti novels of p s johnson he intersperses his text with typographical play blank pages comic interruption see the, these were things that was happening in the new trend you know uh, they were experimenting you know the writers were experimenting with form and style and presentation so uh, typography you know the uh, the way in which uh, the letters were arranged on the pages there were even blank pages comic interruptions happening all of these were uh, part and parcel of the new stylistic experimentations that were happening his novels albert angelo the unfortunate thrive on chaos and disorder as they make bold experiments in form a different view of modern british fiction emerges in the social novels of angus wilson so social novels by people like angus wilson who brings in the subaltern images breaking the provincial framework of the british novel the the downtrodden the, the view from the downtrodden perspective subaltern images Uh, Irish uh, Murdoch her novels are more artistic realistic and highly evocative they are concerned with ideas and ideals and are reminiscent of the novels of manners of romance fantasy and historical roles so Irish Murdoch's novels are you know, more fantasy related and historical modes are there Sparks co religionist you know and other uh, converted roman catholic like anthony burgers who came upon the scene rather confidently with the clockwork orange the wanting seed continued writing fables of the future in a satiric way the british novel had by now taken several new directions wilson and fowles perfected realism murdoch refined the art of characterization spark made her mark in plot construction and anthony burgers showed ways to handle language then going on margaret drabble melvin bragg julian mitchell john burger are some of the novelists still working in the realistic mode their writers their writings show how deep the roots of realism have gone in the british fiction their postmodernist tendencies are reflected in their resorting to experimentation and fantasy the spirit of apocalyptic fantasy uh, gets its expression in angela carter's shadow dance a surreal work the magic toy shop in 1967 now uh, this was in the 60s now what about the novel in the 70s see british british uh, fiction in the 70s lost its vitality 
it's not as virile in the 60s as in the 60s nor as a bully nor as a, a energetic as in the 80s Uh, both stylistically and historically it is a sagging period when contrasted with the swinging 60s 60s were called the swinging 60s so in comparison with the 60s the 70s was not as energetic this is also the time when the novel in english rather than the british novel came to make its mark so it's not british novel anymore it becomes a novel in english why see writers from commonwealth countries gained prominence so it was not only the british man who was writing the british man or woman who was writing it was also people who spoke english people who used english from the commonwealth uh, countries they were also writing in english so it became writings in english novel in english rather than british novel the founding of the booker prize in 1969 introduced a spirit of competition in the literary scene and literature became a marketplace commodity uh, then uh, the novelist uh, vs naipaul trinidadian you know from Trin- trinidad his part documentary and part fictional venture in a free state written in 1971 represents a multicultural scenario encompassing the us britain and africa other novelists who distinguish themselves come from diverse background there is south african writer nadine godima indian novelist ruth prower jabwala's heat and dust paul scott staying on uh, which won the booker prize and brought forth yet another view of imperialism and multicultural reality so this was the time when uh, more voices who, who, of writers writing in english came to the forefront the fiction of the 70s returned to fictions of identity where empire is created afresh uh, j g farrell's the siege of krishnapur uh, deals with the indian mutiny of 1887 while his other novel the singapore grip deals with the japanese invasion of malaya now paul scott's raj quartet consists of four novels the dwell in the crown the day of the scorpion the tower of silence and a division of the spoils uh, the jewel in the crown was uh, televised you know on uh, uh, doordarshan i think you know way back in the 80s i don't know whether any one of you did he yeah so way back in the 80s you know it was televised on national television uh, then uh, uh, during the 19 uh, uh, during the 1980s and 1990s the novel of the post colonial experience became more prominent Remarkable novels in this respect are Ruth Prower Jabwala's Heat and Dust, Anita Deshai's Clear Light of Day, Salman Rushdie's Midnight Children. Uh, both of these novels, Clear Light of Day and Midnight Children, are part of the ZMG Seven that you have to like. Though I think it's an optional paper in Indian writing. Vikram says it's a suitable uh, boy. More recently, Arundhati Roy's The God of Small Things. Then um, another view of history. may be found in the novelist perception of the european cold war lecars the uh, naive and the sentimental lover tinker tailor soldier spy the honorable school boy consider the important questions of the british establishment and its identity another shade of writing in the 1970s may be seen in margaret drabble's the needle's eye where she takes up the question of moral decay Is by its a virgin in the garden is a clear in improvement on her previous works in which she undertakes an ambitious project of writing a multi-layered novel. Now, discovering new modes of perception came to be the most engaging concern of the new novelist. Maureen Duffy and Angela Carter are some of the prominent writers who explored the feminist perspective and took recourse to to magic realism. Uh, like you know elements of magic happening as though it's perfectly natural to happen kind of things that you would find in gabriel garcia's novels even salman rushdie uh, then uh, beril uh, bainbridge is another important writer in this regard she dwells upon the elements of surprise and comic fantasy she possesses the ability of making the strange familiar and the familiar strange and successfully creates the atmosphere of make believe In the mid 70s, writers like Martin Amis and Ian McEwan showed their keen interest in the grotesque and the overly fantastic. Amis in the uh, Martin Amis in the Rachel Papers and McEwan in his collection of short stories, First Love, Last Rites, show their talent in handling these 
uh, themes, you know, themes of grotesque and overly fantastic. While the postmodernist experiment was acquiring newer grounds elsewhere, Britain was lagging behind. In fact, the very phase of fiction was changing as such. A new crop of writers born elsewhere but living in Britain came to the forefront. With this phenomenon, British fiction acquired a variety in viewpoints and styles and became multicultural. So uh, it's not uh, British writing as such, but more like people from different backgrounds who were living in Britain and writing in English. So it actually came to be British fiction. At that point, we can say it became very multicultural. Now, since the 80s, See, after the winter of discontent, following the oil crisis, international recession happening, Margaret Thatcher uh, came in power in the 80s, Britain felt the need to forge ahead in social, economic and cultural arenas. The moral, social and personal codes of the 1950s and 60s and 70s had to be replaced by new myths and money. The free market had come to stay. Literature was a commodity and the writer became a salesman who had to sell his product. The 1980s covers the period between Margaret Thatcher's election in 1979 and her exit from office in 1990. Now, the portrayal of a fragmented British society under Mrs. Torture attracts the attention to Salman Rushdie in the Satanic Verses. Uh, uh, Mrs., uh, the character of Mrs. Torture in uh, Salman Rushdie's Satanic Verses is supposed to be based on the character of Margaret Thatcher. Uh, so uh, the, this, con and uh, you know, he was, how he was persecuted for this, right? The fatwa was called out for him and uh, uh, he, uh, 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 an order was issued uh, for him to be killed you know uh, and he had to actually seek uh, spend several years of his life in hiding and at that point actually britain gave him uh, gave him a safe haven and margaret thatcher the one he had ridiculed you know he did not have any opposition to her on a personal level but rather uh, with regarding uh, with regard to her uh, politics you know so uh, at that point it was margaret thatcher who actually offered him uh, protection in London. Uh, this continues uh, further in Peter Ackroyd Foxmore in 1985, <clears throat> Paul Bailey's Gabriel's Lament in 1986, Michael Moorcock's Mother London in 88. These novels remind one of the Gothic spirit and the Dickensian portrayal of society. So back to, you know, the Gothic portrayal and the Dickensian portrayal of society. Another fictional perspective may be seen in the novels that represent the end of empires. These include Barry Unsworth's novels like Pascal's Island, which deals with the aftermath of the Ottoman Empire, the Turkish Ottoman Empire. Some extremely complex experiments were undertaken at this point of time. We have a pictographic novel, uh, the uh, A Human uh, 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 Moment. Uh, by painter Tom Phillips, uh, a photographic, uh, you know, novel. Uh, nowadays we have graphic novels also. Right? Uh, as uh, style underwent drastic shift, the geography of the new fiction also widened. So it was, I, like I said earlier, it was not only Britain. See, Africa emerged in the writing of William Boyd, South Africa in the novels of Christopher Hope, Arabia and Europe in the writings of Anita Bruckner, uh, Julian Barnes and Julian Barnes, and Arabia in the books of uh, Hilary Mantle. Then uh, apart from all this, travel writing also came to the forefront with Bruce, Bruce Chatwin, Paul Thoreau, uh, Paul Thoreau writing about the railway journeys across, you know, uh, the Silk Route and all those places, uh, Colin uh, Dubron and Jonathan Rabban. Novelists of the multicultural origins came to project richer and diverse versions of the complex human predicament. Salman Rushdie, Vikram Seth from India, Timmy, uh, Timothy Mo from Hong Kong, Kazuo Ishigoro from Japan, Ben Okri and Buchi M. Cheta from Nigeria, Carol Phillips from St. Kitts in the Caribbean, compose a scenario of unprecedented variety. With their diverse linguistic and cultural backgrounds, they enriched the fiction in England, in English and made it truly 
international so we uh, end this uh, you know british novel the meg3 section on british novel with this uh, thought that you know it no longer is british novel it actually becomes novel in english and it encompasses multiculturalism and multiple perspectives by people writing in english from uh, different parts of the world so that is the end of it hmm? uh it was rather a long uh thing i know uh, but i hope you were able to make sense of it uh i will be sharing with you the uh um this powerpoint uh, presentation uh ma'am uh, powerpoint yeah <laughs> yeah the powerpoint exactly i'll be sharing uh, with you the powerpoint okay and we have uh, actually one more class you know uh next week there will be one more session uh and uh, yeah uh, ma'am so that will be, yeah uh yeah that i have one more class with you next week the which will be our final class hmm? yes ma'am ma'am i have a doubt ma'am yes. yes now that the link for re registration is open which would be the ideal uh, subjects like is uh, counselors available for all the subjects that they are offering are you talking with respect to the regional center in kochi or yes, yes ma'am okay uh, i think you would have to ask the respective coordinator because at this point i'm not sure uh, hmm. yeah i they, i know there are uh, teachers uh, but i am not sure for which uh, subjects I, i think you will have to contact uh, the coordinator here that is uh, dr ak prema please do try to contact her and find out for which subjects you will be getting teachers okay, okay ma'am and otherwise also ma'am which will be the ideal combination like there are so many things you know ma'am uh it's up to you you know it's your choice yeah, that's true ma'am but then you know with the availability of uh, notes and then teachers all, all these things makes different you know we are like we are studying it in a you, you do one thing you know i i would suggest you go through the uh, syllabus you know take each paper look at the syllabus and see what what uh, seems attractive to you that would help you to choose you're talking about the optionals right the others yes, are, yeah so just see what uh, draws your attention you know what what uh, are you drawn to personally i think that would be the best way to give you an answer for that right what about yes. the relevance to uh, the present day I, i didn't get uh, i didn't relevance uh, relevance of relevance. the subject to the present day yes relevance uh i i i mean uh, everything is relevant in that way if you look at it right so uh, i i mean i have uh, taught meg 7 okay like that is indian writing and i cannot speak for the other optionals because i don't think i'm in a position to speak about the other optionals you you just i think uh, best is for you to study the you know optionals and what in, includes you know the syllabus in detail and then see uh, i think there is teaching of english also right isn't it yeah. are you sure what are the optionals I know that is Indian writing. Then American literature is there. American novel is there. Yeah. Uh, then Indian writings. Hmm. Uh, then folk writings. Uh, folk writings. Uh, writings from the marginals. Writings from the marginals and all those things. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. So you just have to. I think you you better study the you know optionals and then decide. Take your own decision. I don't think I can speak for anyone. Okay. Ma'am, how about Indian literature? Is it a good subject? Ah, uh, if I can say that because I have taught, so it's pretty easy. I mean, it's not very complicated. If you are looking for that thing, yeah, and and we can connect to it also, right? As Indians, I think we can easily connect with it also. Okay, ma'am. Yes. All right. Okay. So, shall I wind up now? Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. It has been a very long session. Very <laughs> long. <laughs> yeah, it's been a very long session, isn't it? One hour over to you. So I think there are people here who want to. I see the in-call messages, and I see that.
uh, there are people who want to join the whatsapp link please do share okay the others i think you could share it uh, alita joyce has asked uh, so please uh, send her the link someone hmm? uh, okay ma'am anything else that here i need to talk about Oh, someone has asked how many classes are over. Anton Joseph, uh, this was a ninth session. Anton Joseph, if you are still in the class, uh, and uh, I will have one more session with you last. Uh, I mean, coming week, and with that, we'll be ending our session. Okay. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. So, yeah. So we'll have one more uh, session. uh coming week uh, oh uh, alita that was for uh, i will i was telling your classmates to include you in the whatsapp group okay okay ma'am ma um hello yes uh, alita ma'am i i have only received two classes uh, this class only... and the previous class okay uh, why did that happen i received the message uh, for the class day in the on on April thirtieth, and I just joined the class on May first. Okay, uh, you have missed a lot of classes. You, you can ask your classmates help, uh, and I'm sure once uh, you know things are organized, I'm sure the video classes uh, would be uploaded, so you can listen to these classes, the classes that you have missed. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Right. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Okay, Alita. All ma right, Alita. everyone. Yes. Are the videos going to be uploaded in the site? That's that's what I have been informed. Okay. Like you, I am also waiting. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you very much, ma'am. Okay. All right then. Huh? Bye, bye, everyone. Have a nice. Have a nice. Thank you, ma'am. Bye, bye, everyone. <laughs>